Good evening and welcome to Thursday, October 26, 2023, regularly scheduled city council meeting. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Here. Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brown? Here. And Mayor Kaiser? Here. Would you all join in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Thank you. Are there any additions or deletions this evening? Staff has no changes to tonight's agenda. Great. It'll take us to item three. Do we, do we have any presentations tonight? Oh, so sorry. No presentations this evening. Um, so we'll have a report on closed session, please. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, we had a closed session on the item on the agenda and direction was given to staff. Great, thank you. And additional materials this evening? Four emails were received relating to item 9A. Those have been uploaded to the agenda packet online and printed and provided to the city council. Great, thank you. Item six is oral communications by members of the public. Um, this can be done on any of the consent items um, or anything that is not agendized this evening. Um, we will be strict on our three minute limit. So just keep that in mind. Good evening, my name's Karen Hanna. Um, I would like to, first of all, I have three things to talk about. I'd like to thank Public Works for the uh, safety bollard bike racks that were installed on Capitola Avenue this week after two incidents of impaired drivers driving up uh, and crashing on the, on the sidewalk there. Um, this, it, this will sometime, maybe not in my lifetime, but I believe sometime it will save a life or serious injury. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to see that. I also want to thank the city crew um, who's been partnering with the um, landscape group from the BIA to um, help clean up and, and beautify the village. And I think this summer it's looked almost the best it's ever looked. And especially during Art and Wine, it really looks spectacular. They really um, have been, I know they're super, super busy, and they really have been doing an awesome um, job helping with that uh, landscaping improvement. And I also want to thank the city council for paying for the sidewalk cleaning which is really essential. And the BIA has picked up a few of the extra cleanings. And I think it made a huge difference because after those festivals and things, pretty disgusting. So um, thank you very much for that. And we hope that you will keep considering that in your, um, in your budget. And then for everybody listening, um, there's a, a group of residents and business owners who get together on the first Saturday of every month at 9 a.m. at the Esplanade Park. And we do weeding, trash pickup on the beach, clean up the parking lots. Um, been working, uh, cleaning up and weeding the Monterey Avenue wall, which is one of my very favorite spots. And uh, I think that um, that's part of that whole group that's trying to help and, and make, the, make the village look beautiful because we all know it takes a village. So thank you to all the people that have been helping beautify. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Council. My name is Justin Mafia. Um, I am a parent of four minor children in our community, and I wanted to come uh, this evening to share my concerns around the agenda item around book banning. Um, my four kids, minors, can't walk into the Cinelux and go to a rated R movie. My four kids can't walk into an adult bookstore and buy content. The term book banning is so dishonest, and I am asking uh, this council that you consider what this means um, when you are making a generalized statement to a very, very complex issue. And to be clear, I'm not here supporting the banning of books. I am here supporting keeping sexually explicit content away from our minor children 
And the idea that this body wants to openly protect that in our public libraries is a little bit out of control for me. In the resolution that you guys will be voting on in the consent agenda later, it specifically uh, references a book by the, by the title Gender Queer. And I don't know if this body is familiar with some of the content. It is written in comic book style. It is targeted at children. And I wanted to read a passage to you all so you can understand the graphic nature of this. And I apologize to the community, but this has come before this body, and this needs to be said. From page 166, I got a new strap on today. I can't wait to put it on you. It will fill my favorite dildo perfectly. You're going to look so hot. I can't wait to get my cock in your mouth. What is this? Why are we referencing this book in... Capitola City Council, uh, I, I, just, I can't understand why we are not doing the job of protecting our city, building economic prosperity, fixing our streets, and we're taking our time to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you I'll just remind the public to be mindful with your reactions. Thank you. Hey, good evening, uh, TJ Welch, and uh, I also would like to Talk about item 8B on the consent calendar. I'd ask that you pull it and uh, agendize it in a regularly scheduled meeting where we could have real discussion about this. I recognize most of you don't have kids, don't have families, and may not uh, really recognize the impact it has to families. And it's obviously a big issue uh, in this country, as the uh, Library Association pointed out. This is a big, and otherwise you wouldn't even be uh, writing a resolution to try to ban this stuff or talk about the banning. So while I'm not in favor of banning anything, I am totally in favor of letting parents control uh, what gets to be seen and not seen. And uh, as was just pointed out, it's a lot more graphic than that. Uh, you can look at pictures in, this, in these books, and uh, there's a reason why there's a uh, urgency in this country to uh, control what's going on with our kids. And I, I understand where you guys come from. I've watched you guys vote on past items, but I would ask that you Pull it and put it on a regularly scheduled agendized item so other people can have input. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. My name is James Ewing Whitman. What was it? Um, junior Shrub. Fool us once. Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool us all. Shame on us. Two weeks ago, the first half of the meeting was muted. Um, that's just kind of sad. Uh, you know, about the book banning, I was there at that meeting for supposed to last two hours. It didn't last two hours. I took almost five pages of notes before they asked for questions. Kind of waited towards the end. I did interrupt and said that's not accurate at all. And 90% of the people in the room, and there were over 60, looked at me, but I just left it at that. We weren't dealing with Brown's rules or anything. Yeah, you know, Ferris Sabah is a pretty sharp guy. I don't really agree with a lot of what he actually really stands for, and I really appreciate the community talking about some stuff that's really quite obscene. I wouldn't, I just wasn't in my son's education 10 years ago, and I have no idea, well, I can explain why it's in there now. So as a community service with the city of Santa Cruz, I didn't reload. This is the citizen's handbook on page four. It describes how a juror has more power than the Supreme Court or the president. And this is about city managers. So this is for all of you guys. Um, it would be really great if all the K through five were really familiar with that information and also stuff that one of the three constitutions in there, but... Um, it doesn't describe <clears throat> the gold fringe on this U.S. flag and the California flag, which under maritime law is a corporate pirate flag. You know, some of the information about city managers and people, the public, I mean, when I spoke two weeks ago, I hadn't been here in a long time. I have compassion for you, city council members, because you're completely controlled by international organizations since before 1915. Some people say from the 1880s. So the citizens that voted for you kind of have some expectations, and it might be interesting if they understood 
you guys' hands are tied, and that's really sad. You know, uh, once again, I'm really glad that people brought up stuff about the children because that's the future of humanity. And this is a really exciting time to be on planet Earth. I um, guess that's enough for now. I left work at 545 to get here. So nice to see you all. Thank you. Any other speakers for open public comment? Hi, my name is Goran Klapic. I uh, play uh, almost every day uh, at J Street Park basketball. There's a problem that we have at J Street Park. It's a uh, graffiti art. I don't call it graffiti, but it's more like gang affiliated stuff that is going on in a men's bathroom. I don't check the women's bathroom because not, I'm not allowed to use it as a man by law. What I'm saying is here, when uh, somebody uh, discovers something like that and reports that to the police, I don't know who is responsible for that, the public works or the police department to deal with that. I worked as a security guard in Switzerland for a long time, and we had to deal with that a lot, a, a lot of times with that. So uh, I caution you to be more careful about how to uh, deal with those issues in Capitola because it, it could get out of hand. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Thank you. Any other members in house? I don't see any more. Do we have anybody online? We do here. The first speaker will be Ben Vernazza. Ben, when you are unmuted, you will have three minutes to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, you have a presentation. I'm not gonna talk about the whole thing, but I wanna talk about segment nine, which is not on the agenda, uh, which myself in particular, but others consider to be unsafe and dangerous, the ultimate uh, trail that's in nine. Now, the reason why is in the first paragraph. Um, Caltrans, they, oh, the master plan talks about segment 9, 10, and 11 as being 12 feet wide. Caltrans, however, explains that class one bikeways must have two foot shoulders, three feet where feasible, setbacks within objects like fences, posts, and walls, and are not considered part of the traveled way. Because Excuse me, sir. This is actually an item that's on the agenda this evening. It's item 9A. This uh, public comment is open for things on the consent or not agendized. But, but 9 is not on. 10 and 11 are on. I'm talking about 9. I want you to hear me out. It doesn't take long. You've got the information. Now, oh, segment 9 of the trail. Okay. I misunderstood you. Okay. Um, now, um, so let me tell you why I've got other information in there. I've had a conversation uh, with a non-voting uh, public servant. And, the pop, and, and they say, well, no, this is uh, 12 feet wide. It's not eight feet wide, but it is eight feet wide. That's the traveled way by the Caltrans. So that sort of got under my a little bit. And, and finally, I said to him, look, when he said to me, it's a political problem. And I said, no, it's a safety problem. So I only put one, the second two paragraphs there for emphasis, not to discuss tonight. But I want to talk about Capitola. That's, that's really my topic because it's so important to me. I've lived here since 1967 in Aptos. And you know, we get a recreation brochure uh, from you every um, few months. And this last, the last three months we're coming into more than half of the events are for kids. That's great, more than half. 
parents' night out, kids after school, things like that, plus other things that's coming up on Halloween, of course. Now, what else is happening is the Jade Street Park. Thank University. you so much. That has been your three minutes. The next speaker will be John. John, you've been asked to unmute. You'll have three minutes. Hey, guys, give me one second. Your time uh, has started. Uh, can you hear me, though? Yeah, you can. It's fine. So I would also like to talk about item eight. I think you might have cut out. Can you hear me? Hello? Now we can hear you. Hello? All right. So uh, I think it's something I was doing here. It doesn't matter. So I'd like to talk about item, uh, the banning book item in the consent agenda as well. Uh, I'm against banning books, and I have no caveats on this. Uh, I think there's never a reason to ban books. But this ban on banning books is government using its regulatory powers to take away a potential solution in our local community that others clearly do care about. So I agree with the uh, other speakers who say we should put this on the general agenda. This needs to be publicly discussed. And if you do pass this ban, we need to hear your reasons for it. So that's... Uh, that's what I have to say about that. And then uh, what Karen said, also 100%, guys, we need to put more bollards everywhere in town. Our, our lower village is a arterial commuter transport corridor at this point, and that is just bad design. Put the bollards everywhere for safety at minimum. Uh, so thanks for bearing with me, and have a great night, guys. Thank you. The next speaker will be Mary. Mary. You've been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. Hi, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So I wanted to just, um, I was gonna I was gonna talk general comment, but I also wanted to talk about um, banning books. Yeah, um, I'm against that. I think that there are no exceptions uh, to the First Amendment. And I think that the, well, other than what legally are exceptions, but I think the government should never take any kind of step in restricting books or, or um, speech or, or really expression of anything. And I, I think that's good. Even books we don't like or speech we don't like can be um, countered with more speech, right? The other thing I wanted to talk about, and this is general comment, is a California Penal Code 286.5. And I think the city could write an ordinance or something to like expand that. It says every person who has sex with an animal is guilty of a misdemeanor. And we have all these um, white women having sex with, with niggers. And um, ma'am, you have five seconds to return your, your topic to the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council, or we will move on. Okay, okay, you dumb cunt. I'll, I'll get okay, back on top. Please cut the mic. Okay, I'm going to give a warning about the remainder of public comment. This is a limited public forum, which means that there are rules for the type of comment that is permitted. The comment in agenda in items on non-agenda, the comments during the period for non-agendized items must relate to the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. So if those if the comments do not relate to the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council, you will receive one warning and then we will move on. The next speaker, Jack, you've been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. Well, I would just say that when the white three paper faggot country, many of the faggots will be approved. Okay, you have five seconds to relate your comment to the subject matter jurisdiction of Capitola. I am speaking. Cut the mic, please. There are no other speakers with their hands raised, Mayor. All right. Well, we can take this to staff and city council comments. Staff has been calling this evening. Council comments? Is our staff okay to continue? Are you okay? Okay. Um, all right, we're gonna move forward. Um, so, for a second. Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> oh, 
I'm not okay. All right, I'll wait. All right, I've got some comments. Um, I'm gonna take a break. Yeah. Okay, we can take a break. We're gonna take a short five minute recess. All right, welcome back everybody. We will continue with council comments. All right, I'm gonna talk about um, this Saturday's inclusive Adaptive Family Fall Festival happening um, that I'm so excited about. Treasure Cove at Jade Street Park Playground Design Reveal and I invite all of you to please attend our October 28th event from two to four. There will be arts, crafts, books and games. Um, costumes are welcome. Bring your families, bring your kids, bring your friends. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to mention that on the Sunday the 29th is the holiday parade. So um, that is from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. starting at the Esplanade. Um, so that should also be a fun time. I have a few updates. Um, yesterday, I was joined by the vice mayor and city manager and some of our staff with um, our assemblywoman, Dawn Addis, and we were presented with a $1 million check to start the renovations on our community center. Um, Nikki, our uh, director, took us for a tour, so it was um, pretty eye-opening even for me. I pass by that building all the time, and I know we've been discussing it in many lengths about the needs, um, but it was really good to see it firsthand and have the assemblywoman here with us as well. So um, I'm really excited to get that project going. I you know it's a huge uh, improvement for, for all walks of life. Um, some other updates. I know I wanted to just uh, do a shout out to our PD. We've had a couple uh, major uh, arrests, a little activity up on 41st. So just thank you guys for always being prompt and, and on the ball and working with our, our neighboring jurisdictions. Um, and a huge shout out to Public Works. Um, just as Ms. Hanna was saying, um, also I've noticed a ton of work being done right here at City Hall. And um, it really takes a, a a great deal of help and a great team to keep our beautiful city the way it looks. So just want to um, express my gratitude and um, that we here in Capitola are made up of a wide array of, of people, um, all walks of life, male, female, queer, black, white, Hispanic. Some of these comments that have been said tonight are not indicative of our beliefs here in Capitola, um, in many of our neighboring cities. Um, so this type of speech is not going to be tolerated. Any of the comments that come through this evening, um, we have our attorney here, um, and I have our amazing city clerk too, to help us uh, navigate that. I will also extend my sincere apologies for anybody that was offended this evening. I know that I was, um, and I personally will not stand for it. So that, being said, we will move on to the consent um, item eight. All items listed as consent will be enacted in one motion in the form listed below. There'll be no separate discussion unless somebody here would like to pull an item. I have a question for our city attorney. If we do pull an item tonight, we can talk about it tonight. We don't have to wait till it's further agendized. Is that correct? That's correct. With that being said, I would like to pull Consent item um, 8B. Okay. So then we will be pulling 8B and then just voting on 8A and C. I'll make a motion to approve item 8A and C. I'll second. Great. We have a first and a second. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? I pass this unanimously. Thank you. So general government this evening, we'll be starting with night, uh, item 9A. It's the coastal rail trail segments 10 and 11. 
The recommended action tonight is to provide direction to staff on a comment letter on the environmental impact report and consolidated coastal permit request. Um, to start us off this evening is Director Hurley He, and then we'll also be hearing from RTC. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Um, tonight, before you, we have an update on the Coastal Rail Trail segments 10 and 11. Uh, next slide. So just an overview of how this evening is going to go. We'll have a presentation by um, both RTC and the County of Santa Cruz. Tonight, we have Rob Tidmore here from the City of Santa Cruz, who's managing the EIR for this project. We also have a great Grace with us this evening from the RTC. So first we'll have their presentation. After that, I'll give a presentation on what the goal is for the city within the EIR. And from there, we're going to see council questions and to public comment. I just want to clarify that tonight, public comment should be aired. This conversation is really about the goal of the city and whether or not uh, we've got a couple of questions after the guidance this evening. Any public comment made tonight will not be um, submitted to the county towards the EIR. Those comments have to go directly to the county, and I'll have a slide at the end of my slides of how that, how you can comment on the EIR. And then uh, lastly, we'll have discussion and deliberation. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bob. Next slide, please. Thank you, Katie. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Uh, council members. As Katie mentioned, my name is Rob Tidmore. I work for the County of Santa Cruz and I'm the project manager for segments 10 and 11 of the Coastal Rail Trail. And I'm here with Grace Blakesley, who's the senior transportation plan. Is this cutting in and out? A little bit? Okay. I'll try and talk into it better. Um, so Grace Blakesley is the senior transportation planner with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. And I just want to thank you for inviting us back to the city of Capitola. We were last here in March, uh, and we're here to discuss this project again. And I want to thank staff uh, for their collaboration in getting this project uh, to where we are today. Um, so we're here tonight to request Capitola's uh, continued support for the project and your help to successfully deliver the project. The County of Santa Cruz is the lead ag agency for segments 10 and 11. And the project team has been working with the RTC and your staff over the last 24 months to develop the design and the environmental documents. Uh, preliminary design is complete. And as Katie mentioned, the draft EIR is now circulating for public review. And as she mentioned, uh, we're not taking comments on the draft EIR tonight. And then I'll pass this over to Grace to give an overview of the MBSST master plan. Good evening, council members. Um, so for some of you, maybe you're really familiar with the Monterey Bay Scenic Trail, but it may be new for some, so I'm just gonna provide a really brief background and overview. So the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail is a pedestrian and bicycle trail that extends around the entire length of the Monterey Bay. It encompasses both Santa Cruz and Monterey counties um, and traverses the city of Capitola. The Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission led the development of a trail master plan to identify a trail network in Santa Cruz County that would serve the goals of active transportation facilities and foster appreciation for the Monterey Bay. As owner of the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, which extends 32 miles from Davenport in the northern part of the county to Pajaro, just south of the county line in Monterey, the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission, with input from the public, determined that a trail along the rail line, referred to as the Coastal Rail Trail, will serve as the spine of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network. The trail master plan was adopted by the Regional Transportation Commission in 2014 and was also adopted by the City of Capitola in 2015 and adopted by the other jurisdictions through which the trail traverses around that same time period. The master plan is organized into trail segments. Um, there's 20 trail segments identified with logical beginning and end points, which is why you hear us referring to segment nine, segment 10 and 11, et cetera. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of the Coastal Rail Trail project development and the north end, uh, on the left side of the slide is the northern terminus in Davenport. And on the right side of the slide is um, in Pajaro where the trail ends. Um, the areas shown in red indicate that the project is funded through construction and green is completed. 
You can see the region is advancing a significant portion of the coastal rail trail, which will really transform our community's bicycle and pedestrian network, in large part due to the recent competitive grant awards, including the 67 million um, in active transportation program funding that was awarded from the state uh, to the county of Santa Cruz for the project you're hearing about today. Um, you guys probably zoom right in on it. You can see Capitola is right there in the middle of the slide. Uh, two miles of almost 18 miles of the coastal rail trail that are funded through construction are located within the Capitola city limits. One of the main reasons we've been so successful in moving these projects forward is all the interagency collaboration that's occurred on this project for over a decade. As you can tell when you look at our county and how these, this bike path um, traverses some of the most densely populated areas of our county, that these projects are, gonna, are transformative. But they are also complex, they are also expensive, and involve dozens of agencies, reviews, and approvals. So the partnerships that we have with the RTC, the County of Santa Cruz, City of Capitola, are really critical in making progress and getting these projects to the end point. So I wanted to talk just briefly about the area um, south of Capitol or south of Aptos, segments 13 through 20, which is shown in kind of a peach pink color, and then also um, what's shown as segment 11B in Capitola. So right now, we just are kicking off a project to engage with the community to develop these segments that are shown in pink that have not advanced into pre-construction. We are doing so as part of the Regional Transportation Commission Zero Emission tra Trail sorry, zero emission rail and trail project. And um, so I ask you to stay tuned as you'll be seeing lots of information um, coming out about the development of those segments, including the Capitola trestle um, here in the next coming months. I'm gonna hand it back over to Rob um, to talk about the project description and design. Next slide, please. All right, now I'm going to move to a focused overview of the Segment 1011 project. This is a map showing Segment 10 in green, which starts at 17th Avenue and goes to 47th Avenue. The Capitola city limits are overlaid on the image in dark gray uh, for reference. Segment 11, shown in purple, starts at 47th Avenue. Next slide. And passes through New Brighton State Beach before ending at State Park Drive. Next slide. Now I just wanna take a few minutes to talk about the project benefits to Capitola residents. Um, Grace mentioned this already, but um, with this project, you'd be getting two miles of dedicated, separated from traffic, multi-use bicycle and pedestrian trail, which as she mentioned, connects directly to 18 miles of additional trail, which is scheduled to come online uh, by 2029, which means that someone living in the city could get on their bike or walk from their house or on their trail all the way up to Davenport and all the way down to Aptos, which is a very exciting thing to contemplate very soon. The trail is also centrally located. It's within one mile of all of your residents and within half a mile of 90% of them. That means that 90% of people living in Capitola will be a 10 minute walk away from the trail. So it's really transformative for the, the city in general. The trail is gonna provide car free access to important destinations, uh, one of which was mentioned tonight, Jade Street Park and the upcoming all-inclusive playground, the 41st Avenue Commercial Corridor and New Brighton State Beach and people will be able to get there without driving and then trying to find a parking space when they get there. It provides uh, sidewalk gap closures on Park Avenue and provides a parallel route for the non-existent sidewalks on Cliff Drive and McGregor. And it improves free coastal access without requiring people to get into their cars. And all of this comes with no construction cost to the city of Capitola. But perhaps most importantly, the trail and all the other rail trail segments will contribute to a mode shift to walking and biking and a reduction in the amount of driving helping our region meet very important greenhouse gas reduction goals. Next slide, please. Now zooming out to include the entire project, um, 26,000 people when you look at the entirety of segments 10, 11 live within a 10 minute walk of the trail and there are 46,000 people within one mile of this project. Um, next slide, please. The full project includes 4.2 miles of trail, 
and runs the entire length of the city of Capitola from roughly 38th Avenue out to uh, New, Brighton State, uh, New Brighton State Beach. Next slide, please. And it provides connections between low income areas of the city. Next slide. Affordable housing. Next slide. And a whole host of community serving amenities, including 10 schools, two community centers, 18 parks and beaches, Simpkins Swim Center, where I work, four libraries, and multiple senior facilities and commercial centers in the immediate vicinity, not to mention all the other great destinations along the way, like the Boardwalk and downtown Santa Cruz. And just as an aside, uh, I took these slides directly from uh, our successful ATP grant application, and the project was deemed so beneficial and so transformative on a statewide level that the California Transportation Commission awarded it the largest ATP grant in state history. Okay, next slide, please. All right, now onto the details. So the project is pursuing a phased approach to trail development. And under the phased approach, there are two different ways in which the rail corridor could be developed with the trail, the ultimate trail and the interim trail, both of which are included in the draft DIR as part of the proposed project and therefore analyzed in an equal level of detail uh, in the EIR. The first way is shown on the screen in front of you, which is the ultimate trail, um, and it uh, in involves building the trail next to the rail line. As Grace mentioned, this is consistent with the MBSST master plan, and this will be the focus of my design presentation tonight, since this is the uh, configuration in which we applied uh, for the ATP grant. Um, but I just, it's important to note that the county board of supervisors have not yet made a decision on which configuration to pursue, and will not do so until March of next year when the final EIR is certified. So with the ultimate configuration, the existing rail line is preserved and the trail is built next to the tracks, maintaining the required offset distance from center line of tracks. Uh, in this configuration, this trail is generally 12 feet wide, but is reduced in some areas due to constraints and widened in others where there's additional room. Fencing is required on the side of the trail next to the tracks, which you can see in the center of the screen, and on the far side of the trail where uh, grade changes make it necessary for safety, uh, like you can see on the right side of the screen there. Uh, under this configuration, the project would include 4.2 miles of trail, would involve new bicycle uh, and pedestrian bridges, and as Grace mentioned, the half mile section across the Soquel Creek and Capitola Trestle would be part of a larger, uh, later project phase. Next slide, please. So the second way in which the corridor could be developed is to implement an optional first phase as part of the project where the existing railroad tracks are removed and an interim trail is built on the rail line. This approach would require rail banking of the corridor in order to be able to remove the railroad tracks. Under this scenario, the trail is generally 16 feet wide, but is reduced to 12 feet in several areas due to constraints. Fencing is not required with this option, except where grade changes make it necessary. Uh, this option would, res would result in 4.7 miles of trail because of the additional half mile associated with the Capitola trestle, and would convert existing rail bridges to bicycle and pedestrian bridges. If the rail line were later reactivated, the optional first phase would be followed by future phases where the interim trail is removed, the railroad tracks are rebuilt, and a new trail is built next to the rail line in the ultimate trail configuration. And I will not be going into detail on the interim trail designs during this presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So since we presented a detailed design review to you all back in March, I'm gonna walk through an abbreviated version of that, of that same design. So in segment 10 in green, the trail is on the inland side of the tracks. In this area, it ranges from 11 to 14 feet wide, and the uh, trail switches to the coastal side of the tracks at 47th Avenue. The project also includes one and a half miles of relocated railroad track from 17th to just past 47th Avenue, and there are retaining walls on the inland side to hold up the existing slopes. And in my next few slides, I'll be focusing on three key areas, 41st Avenue, Jade Street Park, and the Cliff Drive parking lot and plaza. Next slide, please. So these are two views of the 41st Avenue railroad crossing looking east. The image on the left is existing and the image on the right is proposed, uh, showing the proposed trail and relocated track. Bulb outs have been added on both sides of 41st Avenue to shorten the crossing distance and improve the visibility of trail users. 
As with all the crossings, green cross bike pavement, it's basically a combination of a bike lane and a, and a crosswalk. Um, markings are shown there, and there are LED flashing pedestrian crossing signs added to improve safety and visibility of people crossing the street. Next slide, please. Uh, here we are at Jade Street Park. Again, um, two views, left is existing, right is proposed. We're looking west. Um, so there's no fencing uh, on the park side, which is intentional is to provide maximum permeability between the trail and the park. Uh, and this is a very important community asset. Uh, the existing redwood trees that are on the park side will all be retained. And then at the bottom of the image, the trail, you can see the trail switching from the inland to the coastal side at 47th. Um, we're, the project is also adding a bulb out at the southeast corner of 47th, um, which will help slow turning cars and improve safety. And just as a note, the, the image incorrectly omits the green cross bike uh, painting that will happen uh, at the trail crossing on the right side of the screen. Next slide, please. All right, moving slightly farther east, these are two views of the Cliff Drive parking lot looking west. Um, and here the trail is on the coastal side of the tracks, which takes advantage of the wider RTC right of way and also serves to maximize ocean views and connection to the coast. The existing on street diagonal parking lot, which is partially on RTC property, has been reconfigured to parallel parking in order to fit the trail next to the tracks and retain the existing on street bicycle lane. The existing class two bike lane has been improved with green striping for better visibility and the change to parallel parking configuration reduces the risk of a car backing into the uh, cyclist that's using the bike lane. The initial parking lot designed for this area included 23 spaces, which is a reduction of 23 spaces from the 46 that were there originally. And uh, based on input from city staff, uh, the latest design now expands the parking area southwest along Cliff Drive, so there are now 34 spaces proposed. Next slide, please. At the end of the parking lot, a trail plaza is proposed within the RTC right-of-way, which will have seating, uh, bike racks, and potentially space for some sort of public art installation. The project also includes a formalized rail crossing, an improved and widened concrete staircase up the hill that leads to Prospect Avenue and Opal Street to improve neighborhood connectivity. Uh, just as a note, this crossing is subject to CPUC approval, but we think it has good chances of of being approved due to the well-documented historic use in this area. This drawing also shows where the trail ends and connects to the existing crosswalk uh, across Cliff Drive. And on the next slide, I'll show how people will transition from the trail to the existing bicycle and pedestrian facilities through the village. Next slide, thank you. All right, from the trail end at Cliff Drive, trail users will be directed to use existing bike lanes and sidewalks through Capitola Village and up to the Monterey and Park Avenue intersection where the trail restarts on the upper right hand of the screen. In addition to all the other benefits I mentioned earlier, the project will also be improving the existing bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure along this route through several methods. The first is uh, similar to other portions of the rail trail, like segment eight in front of the boardwalk where there are existing bicycle facilities that are part of the trail. The project will be adding green paint to the existing bike lanes and the, uh, the, the existing class two bike lanes and class three sharrows, which will improve visibility of cyclists and better delineation of bike infrastructure and will also help with wayfinding. We will also be installing rail trail branded wayfinding signage through the village to help trail users navigate from one end of the trail to the other. And most significantly, the project will be restriping a 350 foot long uh, section of cliff drive on the bottom left hand corner of your screen from the end of the trail at the Cliff Drive Plaza to where the sidewalk starts on the coastal side of Cliff Drive. And uh, we'll be doing this in order to create a separate four foot wide pedestrian pathway next to the uh, five foot wide class two bike lane, which will create separation between cyclists and pedestrians where there currently is none. And finally, I'll just note that restaurants and other businesses in the village could potentially see a benefit from increased visitation as a result of trail users traveling through the village and stopping along their way. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so Rob talked about the improvements to the bicycle and pedestrian network in Capitola Village that are funded through the Coastal Rail Trail Segment 10 and 11 project. 
And in discussions with your staff, um, RTC staff understands that there's a desire to continue to enhance and add new bicycle and pedestrian um, access within Capitola Village specifically. So the RTC and the City of Capitola staff have come up with steps to work towards this goal. Um, and it starts with the RTC, RTC leading development of a grant to develop an active transportation plan for Capitola Village specifically. We are targeting a Caltrans planning grant and applications are due in January 2024. Development of this active transportation plan is a critical step towards identifying scoping the desired um, new bicycle and pedestrian facilities and with robust public engagement that we could see funding for capital um, construction for. Um, furthermore, RTC staff will work with the City of Capitola uh, to conclude funding for the priority improvements identified in the active transportation plan for S Capitola Village in future state and federal funding requests. Uh, funding requests could include new sidewalks on Cliff Drive, which City of Capitola staff has expressed as a high priority. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Capitola Trestle because we've received a number of questions about the Capitola Trestle through development of the Coastal Rail Trail Project. Uh, we put together a frequently asked questions document to help answer some of the questions we've heard and it's included in your packet. I hope you find it informative. It'll also be posted on the RTC website. Um, one question that we are asked is, can a bicycle and pedestrian bridge be attached to the existing Capitola Trestle? And the answer to this question is no. The Capitola trestle is not suitable to cantilever a bicycle and pedestrian bridge from due to its structural integrity. It is a different kind of bridge than the San Lorenzo uh, trestle, where we have seen a, can a bridge can a bicycle and pedestrian bridge cantilevered from it. Another question we receive is, can a separate bicycle and pedestrian bridge be constructed across Soquel's Creek and within the RTC-owned rail line right-of-way? The answer to this is it may not be feasible due to the space and right of way needed for the bridge, as well as the engineering challenges to place the bridge abutments next to the existing rail trestle abutments within the rail line right of way. You're all probably very familiar with how the land around the base of the trestle has developed, and we would need space to place new bridge footings in this area and within the RTC right of way if we were to construct a separate bridge. So due to these constraints, the current approach by RTC is to replace the existing trestle with a combined bike and pedestrian bridge over so Soquel Creek as part of the Regional Transportation Commission's rail project that's currently underway. Another question we receive is, can the Capitola trestle be converted to a bicycle and pedestrian bridge? From a constructability perspective, it is possible to convert the Capitola trestle, a trestle from a rail bridge to a trail bridge if the bridge is rehabilitated. However, there are regulatory challenges that we that would need to uh, sorry regulatory changes that would need to occur to be able to remove the tracks from the Capitola trestle, and this would involve the process of rail banking, where the freight operator would need to file for direct abandonment with the Surface Transportation Board, or for RTC or another interested party to file for adverse abandonment. The Regional Transportation Commission has discussed rail banking extensively over the last few few years, and at this time is not pursuing it. Next slide. Uh, specific to the segment 10 and 11 Coastal Rail Trail Project, the Capitola Trail conversion and trail on the Capitola Trestle was not included in the county's active transportation program grant application and the scope, it, the scope was not included and therefore is not funded as part of the project you're hearing about today. However, repair and conversion of the trestle to support the multi-use trail is in included as part of the interim trail configuration analyzed in the draft EIR, which would allow the project to be environmentally cleared should this option be pursued in the future. During discussions with your staff early on in development of this project, we heard that the city's preference is to have the trail on the trestle, and therefore the project team added the trestle conversion to part of the ultimate trail design as a design option in the environmental document. So again, that should this project be pursued in the future, it would already be environmentally cleared through this process. Should the um, Capitola Trestle Trail be, sorry, the Capitola Trestle be converted to a trail, the trail would continue past the Cliff Drive Plaza that um, Rob was explaining to you a few minutes ago and transition onto the alignment of the existing tracks, which would then be removed. 
the trestle would be repaired and converted to the trail use, and then the trail would con trail would transition back to the ultimate trail configuration on the coast side of the tracks just past Monterey Park intersection. So I know there's a lot of details there, um, and we're happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation, should there be some. I, I encourage you to take a look at the fact sheet. It is really helpful. All right, moving on to segment 11. So the trail starts again at the Monterey and Park intersection. As Grace mentioned, the trail is on the coastal side from Monterey to Mar Vista, and then switches to the inland side from Mar Vista to State Park Drive. Again, here the trail is 12 feet wide, uh, but it narrows to 10 feet at intersections for safety purposes to slow trail users, that's intentional. And then at, uh, some of the existing bridges where there's not room to, uh, uh, sorry, some of the, the new bridges where it's difficult to provide a sufficient width uh, or a, a 12 foot wide width on, on those bridges. Um, there are also several viaducts and a new uh, trail bridge at the new Brighton Access Road over crossing. And then there's retaining walls uh, in many areas due to the steep slopes uh, and existing grades. So here I'm going to focus on three key areas. Um, the Monterey to Grove section, the um, portion of the trail from Grove to Coronado, uh, which includes the, the Coronado street ramp. So next slide, please. So Monterey Avenue to Grove Lane, um, the steep topography and abundant trees between Monterey and Grove make this one of the more challenging portions uh, of the project. So the design team explored three different options in conjunction with the city of Capitola to determine which alignment had the least environmental impacts. Trail on the inland side of the tracks, a trail on the coastal side of the tracks, and then a trail along Park Avenue. Um, the trail on the coastal side of the tracks requires the least number of tree removals and has the least impacts. However, as you can see on the image in front of you, the steep topography necessitates the use of retaining walls to hold up the slope. The original design shown on the left utilized a single tall retaining wall, and the latest designs shown conceptually on the right utilize two smaller walls to raise the trail grade above the railroad grade, which is reduces cost, avoids the need for underground anchors below adjacent properties, and just generally makes the, tr the walls less imposing to trail users. Next slide, please. Oh, it looks like it didn't update. Oh, that's okay. All right, I'll go on the old one. Okay, so um, since our March presentation to council, uh, we completed schematic design for an inland alignment, uh, inland alignment design option between Grove and Coronado, which is in addition to the original uh, coastal alignment. And this is an area where we'd like to get feedback from city council to help inform project direction. Uh, this additional uh, design option was added to the project at the request of the Coastal Commission in early 2023 due to their concerns about the rate of bluff erosion in the area and their hesitation uh, to permit a project that may be impacted by bluff erosion during the lifespan of the facility. Uh, in addition, the Coastal Commission also requested a bluff erosion analysis that included the impacts of sea level rise. The results of that analysis are still pending and we'll share them with uh, city staff when, when they're ready. Um, so I'll start with the coastal alignment here. Um, there's two portions shown. The, first, the, the western side shows the connection at Grove Lane, and the uh, right side of the screen shows the connection to Coronado Street. Um, the primary difference uh, between uh, the coastal and the inland alignment is that um, uh, the... So, okay, so, sorry. A um, little thrown here because the slides are different. That's okay. Um, so, all right. So on the coastal side, um, there's, there's two access points to the trail, uh, one at Grove Lane and one at Coronado, no access from Park Avenue to the trail in between those areas. The coast uh, side trail requires some retaining walls on the coastal side due to the existing grade. And then on the right side of the screen, you can see that transitions to viaducts as you move closer to the new Brighton parking lot. This option does provide better access to the coast and continuous access to the existing coastal bluff trails in the area. At uh, Grove Lane, you can see on the left side of the screen, the existing sidewalk gap on Park Avenue has been infilled as part of the project and that provides ADA access from Park Avenue down to the trail. And at Coronado, uh, the existing informal steep dirt trail that many people use to access New Brighton, you can see is replaced by an ADA accessible uh, viaduct supported ramp going down from Coronado and Park 
uh, to the trail there. And uh, you'll see this on both options, but the, the project also includes a new formal concrete staircase uh, in conjunction with state parks to, to provide better access to New Brighton. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the, the new uh, inland alignment option that you have not seen previously. So again, Grove Lane is on the left, Coronado is on the right. Um, on the Grove Lane connection, uh, the, the project does provide the sidewalk gap infill there, um, but due to existing grades um, and the fact that the trail is now closer to Park Avenue, there's, there's not ADA access for on the sidewalk to the trail. So you can see there's an addition of a switchback ramp and staircase a little bit farther east on Park Avenue to bring people down to the trail uh, in an ADA accessible route. The inland alignment has similar environmental impacts to the coastal alignment. There are four additional tree removals that are required as part of the inland alignment. And um, generally speaking, the inland alignment requires a, a single retaining wall uh, along the Park Avenue edge due to the existing grades there. On the east side of the screen, the Coronado connection uh, is similar but different in that it still provides an ADA access ramp from Coronado down to the trail, but has done so with retaining walls rather than a viaduct. And the, the existing informal crossing is, is improved in, in both scenarios. And similar to the Opal Street staircase, this formal crossing is subject to CPUC approval, um, but we think due to the existing high historical usage that we should have no problem getting this one approved. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I just want to go over some key public input to date. Um, the project team has held numerous public engagement events over the last 24 months, including uh, the earlier presentation to your council that I mentioned uh, earlier. And an integral part of this project um, is the public input process. And we've had extensive coordination with your staff, um, working closely during design reviews and incorporating their comments into this project. Uh, I gave examples of some of those uh, during the design overview. And again, just noting that we're in the 60-day public review period for the draft EIR and that the county will be holding a public meeting on November 16th from 5 to 7.30 p.m. to accept comments. Uh, next slide, please. So project schedule and next steps. Uh, these are the major project milestones. The top half of the screen is ones we've already completed. And then on the bottom half of the screen is the, the current uh, draft review and the public meeting as well as uh, the upcoming certification of the final EIR, which is expected in March of 2024. And that will conclude the environmental review process. On the federal side of the project, Caltrans is the lead uh, for uh, uh, federal environmental clearance and the project is on track to receive a categorical exclusion in early 2024. And then final design, right of way and permitting will begin after completion of environmental review. The ATP grant funding that we've mentioned has several deadlines associated with it, including that the project completes the environmental review process uh, next spring and completes final design right of way and permitting by 2026 and starts construction uh, that same year. Uh, therefore, it's, it's absolutely critical that the project keeps moving forward and avoids project delivery risk wherever possible. So one of the, the recommended actions in the staff report today is um, for the council to provide direction to staff on whether to pursue a consolidated coastal development project uh, permit process for this project. And consolidation allows the project to receive a single CDP from the Coastal Commission rather than having to get three separate CDPs, one from the county, one from the city, and then a third from the Coastal Commission for the portion of the project over Soquel Creek. And the county's position is that CDP consolidation is preferred from a streamlining process, which avoids having three separate CDPs moving forward all of which would have different standards of review, the county's local coastal program, the city's local coastal program, and then for the coastal, coastal Commission, the Coastal Act, which would complicate and potentially confuse public participation. Further, each CDP would have its own timing and participation requirements, potentially involving a mix of local hearings, Coastal Commission hearings, and then later potential appeal hearings, making it harder for the public to participate. Part of the Coastal Commission's threshold for accepting the consolidation process is that it doesn't prejudice local participation. So there'd be guardrails in place to ensure sufficient local participation, which would include accepting written comments, uh, uh, hybrid uh, participation option in the Coastal Commission hearing, and then potentially scheduling the hearing to occur at a nearby district. 
And as a, you saw on the previous slide, you know, we've always believed that robust public engagement is a critical part of the project. So we'd, we'd work with uh, your staff to schedule additional um, meetings on the project if, if you felt that was necessary. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, we want to work with the city to bring these extensive project benefits to Capitola residents at no cost to the city. And we've built maximum flexibility into the project delivery and approval process to keep all options on the table for you as decision makers, including what Grace mentioned, which is approving a trail conversion of the Capitola trestle as part of the ultimate trail project. And as she mentioned, this is a huge complicated project with significant benefits to everyone from Live Oak, Pleasure Point, Capitola, Seacliff, Aptos, and it requires all of us continuing to work collaboratively with your staff to deliver the project for our residents. Uh, RTC has committed to working collaboratively with your staff to seek funding for additional active transportation planning and projects in the Capitola Village that would be pursued separately. And we respectfully request that the council direct staff to write a letter of support for the project's draft DIR and to approve CDP consolidation through the Coastal Commission. Thank you so much for your time, and we'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. And on this last slide, just as the public knows, this is our contact information, including uh, at the bottom where to send comments on the draft DIR. You can email them to the email address there, send them to me um, via mail, or attend the November 16th public meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, next slide, please. Now, thank you, Rob and Grace, for your presentation. I'm gonna quickly go, go over Capitola's ro um, role within this project. So, uh, next slide, please. So, as Rob explained, this project is subject to CEQA, the California Environmental Equality Act. We really need to look at the overall impacts and that, that's what the public comment will be based on that goes into the next 60 days that the county will be collecting. Um, the county is the lead on the environmental review and we are responsible agencies, the RTC, as well as the city of Capitola. Next slide, please. And the reason why we're a responsible agency is because we do have a role in reviewing the permits for um, the coastal development permit, as well as a tree removal permit and um, grading permits for this project. So what our role is as a responsible agency, First, we had, as um, as discussed, we've been in, we've had many discussions with the county on the project. Currently, we're in the step of reviewing the EIR. When you have the opportunity, it's optional to submit comment on the EIR um, through either a, sh a letter of support or to um, um, identify any shortcomings in the EIR. Um, the city, as a responsible agency, also has the ability to challenge the EIR and also um, come up with other alternatives. Um, and then when we go through our permitting process for the coastal development permit and the tree removals, that's a separate process in which we can have our own mitigation me measures. Next slide, please. Um, so within the draft EIR, we we, we did submit com in our conversations with county staff. We did clearly state that we have a preference for option A, which is uh, locating the trail over the trestle. Um, and then we also, in our comments, suggested some improvements through the village between the two endpoints of the trail. Next slide, please. And the, the county was very receptive in the RTC to these requests. Um, the project has been revised to include um, within on Cliff Drive, a 350 um, linear foot portion of it to allow a separate four foot wide pedestrian path next to the class two bike lanes. So really separate, like creating a new place for the pedestrians to walk. Also the repainting the white stripes and adding green pavement throughout the village. So there'd be green paint, I'm sorry, the green paint on the existing class two from point A to point B. And then also in those areas where we don't have a bike lane, updating it with these beautiful new um, sharrows. Um, next slide, please. This next slide is just the map through the village. I'm not gonna focus in on this one because Rob gave a really good overview of that. Next slide, please. 
Um, two items that we did, in, we also asked for were ADA improvements through the Capitola Village and then a new sidewalk on Cliff Drive. At this time, they couldn't commit to that due to the current funding. Um, but as Grace stated, uh, RTC is willing to look at other grant opportunities for the city to look at enhancements through the city or through through the village. Uh, next slide, please. And the second part of the discussion tonight is the consolidated CDP. So coastal development permits are usually reviewed by our planning commission and they look at um, a coastal development permit to see if a project enhances the public views, if it creates more recreational opportunities, if it protects uh, the natural vegetation, um, maintains and enhances coastal resources. So that's really what the review is by the Planning Commission. The county is, has requested that this be a consolidated CDP. So it wouldn't be reviewed by the Planning Commission. It would um, go directly to the Coastal Commission for review. And it would, instead of uh, reviewing the criteria we have in our code, it would be reviewed against the Coastal Act. Next slide, please. So tonight we're seeking feedback on whether or not the um, City Council would like to submit a comment letter on the EIR, and then also if there is support for a consolidated CDP at this time. Um, and next slide, please. So just to, uh, I think Rob is, Hit this one pretty cl clear, but tonight we will not be taking the public comment and giving it to the county as part of the EIR. That's a separate process. Folks are welcome to email their comments to the email address on the or on the slide or go to the November 16th meeting. So with that, that concludes our presentation this evening. And we are available for questions. And then after that, we'll go to public comment. So. Thank you. Great job. Um, any questions from council? <laughs> okay. Questions first? Anybody? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation and for um, mentioning the future plans for the Capitola Trestle because I think that that's something that a lot of people in Capitola have on their mind. Um, and I'll try to word these questions as clearly as I possibly can for such kind of a complicated issue. And I'm afraid that I'm gonna make it more confusing. So please stop me if at any point this sounds like I'm just speaking nonsense. Um, so right now we're looking at these kind of interim and ultimate trail options. Um, but my understanding is with the need for us to replace the Capitola trestle in the future, there is essentially an ultimate, ultimate option, which is that third option much further down the road where the trestle gets replaced entirely, and we will have pedestrian and bike going over the trestle, though it will be a new trestle, a new bridge, correct? Okay. Um, so at RTC, um, and for those who don't know, myself and Councilmember Peterson are on the RTC, um, we recently approved a project concept report for passenger rail service. And if I'm not mistaken, that report will be done around 2027, or at least the contract goes to 2027? 2026. 2026, okay. And that's when we're gonna find out more details about the replacement of the bridge? Of yes. Russell. Okay, and then I also understand there's gonna be a whole new EIR for that, right? For the replacement of the trestle. When will we expect that to come? Um, that would follow the project concept report. So pending funding, it would begin in 2026 and be completed in 2028. Okay. Um, so by 2020, and so we're expecting to see construction of this, um, what we're now referring to as inter, uh, ultimate trail through the village in 26. So we would have essentially two years of people, uh, pass, um, bike and pedestrian coming through the village before we would get the final EIR for a replacement of the trestle. Is that correct? Well, the completion of the um, project that you're hearing about today, I think it's a three-year construction period, so it'd be 2029. Oh, okay, so we would actually have the EIR for the trestle replacement before bike and pedestrian um, traffic increases through the village due to the trail. Yes, I mean, depending funding availability, we have to do not have the EIR for the passenger rail project fully funded, but we are seeking funding to complete that package. Okay. Um, I think that's, 
I know that didn't sound like a question. I was just making sure I understood. So I think that's, um, I think the rest of my comments, I think everything else is a comment and I'll wait till it comes back. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I'm curious about the uh, consolidated coastal development permit and um, do we know like what specific differences there would be if we approve that compared to um, our code compared to the Coastal Act? I think like, the, are they very similar or are they some key differences that you could highlight? I believe the findings are quite similar because um, you know there's eight findings within our zoning code and they're really about access to recreation and coastal opportunities and protecting the environment, which is a lot of the same language that is in um, the Coastal Act. So I, I can't say for sure how much duplication, but the goals are there of maintaining access and recreational opportunities. I think one of the newer items that we included in our code was um, ac um, more affordable access, so for lower income to, you know, at, at less cost of recreation support for that. I'm not sure if that's in the original Coastal Act, but. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, uh, we will go to public comment for this item. Anybody in house? There you go. How many people are wishing to speak on this item this evening? Okay, we're fine. All right, making sure the mic works. Good evening, council and staff. Thank you to the staff for putting up signs at the rail endpoints, noting the agenda item tonight, um, and drafting a comprehensive staff report for reading ahead of this meeting. It was really helpful and well-written. I was particularly interested in learning more about Measure L and the concept of a continuous pathway to keep the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail within the rail corridor and not allow a detour around the trestle. I'm not rooted in the Greenway debate. As a matter of fact, we were a house divided on Measure D with one of us voting for and one of us voting against because we clearly see both sides of the opportunity. I also now see the challenge of honoring the responsible agency role to uphold Measure L when the authority over the use of the trestle is with the lead agency or county and RTC who owns the rail corridor and seemingly excluded trestle repair costs in the raising and distributing of a funds effort to date. I got heard tonight that there'll be some continuing funding efforts, but I also heard that the RTC is not pursuing rail banking and that it was not part of the ATP grant scope for funding. So there's some inconsistencies in what, what I'm hearing there about the goal. Um, like the city, I support the preference for design option A with the trail located on the trestle. The EIR did, did respond to city comments on improving bike lanes and striping, but it did not respond to comments from the city regarding surface street improvements, including the sidewalks on Cliff Drive. Which brings me to my second point. At the October 12th City Council meeting, we learned a lot about the Cliff Drive Resiliency Project. And I'm here tonight. My name is Leslie Nielsen. I'm representing the group of four property owners on the ocean side of Cliff Drive who have been informed, thank you for the transparency, that new and potentially widened sidewalks are a discussion point for the section of Cliff Drive that we all use for ingress, egress, and parking now to the extent widening is a consideration, several parking spots would be lost. A wider sidewalk for a very short stretch of Cliff Drive in front of four residences before the sidewalk abuts buildings does not improve safety on Cliff Drive. Diverting non-motorized traffic off a trail expected to be widely used will add a lot of pedestrian, bike, et cetera, traffic, and we know the motorized traffic on that stretch shows no signs of slowing down. The garage and carport access to the homes on Cliff Drive, of which three of the four are short-term vacation rentals, would be lessened and likely increase the risk of collision. Until we can study the safety of this suggestion, I would like to see it stay decoupled from the EIR being commented on related to the rail trail project and instead be included in discussions for the Cliff Drive Resiliency Project. Creating an unsafe major city access street corridor is not the answer to avoid funding the common sense solution to promote the rail corridor 
safe access with a rail bank or replacement trestle, comps, trestle complex. To the extent tonight's topic or project requires approval of a CDP, giving you the choice. Thank you. That's consolidated or other. I would go with other. Let's go in front of the Planning Commission, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Karen Hanna. As you know, whenever we talk about this, it sets my hair on fire because Capitola Village is one of the least safe places to bike right now, and nothing in this current plan will improve that at all. Um, yes, painting green on the, yeah, it gives, it's a slight improvement. And um, the area where most of the green painting is going to take place, which is down cliff, is not the part that's most dangerous. The dangerous part in Capitola is Monterey Avenue. Going up it because it's steep, cyclists will lose balance, stop, have to walk. Um, many, you know, we've got 19 docking stations full of rental bikes coming. So all those people will be trying to ride through Capitola Village. And then coming down Monterey, there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing. There's a narrow sidewalk, and then you're in with all the traffic. Um, so this is, does nothing to help that. Um, and I also worry that the active transportation plan it's going to be something like, oh, well, let's get rid of all the parking and put in bike lanes, which I don't think is going to be acceptable either. So we, we really have a dilemma here. So um, I would sort of like to echo what Leslie said and what she didn't really get to finish was, um, I know that the consolidated um, CDP process claims to have plenty of individual public input, but I know the people of Capitola will come to hear the Planning Commission and they will talk to the Planning Commission. And if it's sort of taken away from that, and I know that the Coastal Commission can just ride roughshod over everybody. I've been to their meetings and um, it's nothing, not, they won't hear us like the Planning Commission will hear us. So I'm, I'm asking that you, at, at a minimum, separate the process because people in Capitola love that trestle. They want to know what's going on with it, as, as indicated by the vote. Um, basically, I'm asking that you don't accept uh, segment 11 at all until segment B is, um, is decided. And that's going to be many years down the line. Yes, it'll, it'll delay everything, but things aren't going to improve in the village as far as, as, far as bike safety anyway. So why not just wait and have something that might actually allow people to do what they're claiming it's doing, which is to be able to ride from one end of the county to the other car free, car, car safe. It's not going to happen. You're still being forced off the trail into the traffic. Thank you. That's Thank you. Three minutes. Thank you. Hello, Council. Thank you for uh, hearing this, this uh, for holding this meeting. But my name is Barry Scott. I live in Rio del Mar. I'm a, a trained as an architect, and I uh, am involved in educational matters today. The uh, I'm excited about the ultimate trail, the possibilities of uh, a new bridge. I want to say something about the very popular trestle and, and bridge. Uh, facility, which is that it's very old and it will need to be replaced eventually. And it can be replaced with something quite beautiful. Even, even the, the, the sections could be nearly replicated, although that might not be the best solution. I'm glad that there's such a thing as an ultimate trail design that can be built soon while waiting for the rail study to be completed. I think uh, citizens need to understand that the, the rail line is a, is a public utility owned by the county, uh, that it was purchased for the purpose of, of rail transit and a trail, and that um, these magnificent grants that we've been getting, thank you RTC, uh, may partly be because of the multimodal nature of the projects. 
if it's going to take, and according to the, the prior executive director of the RTC, it could take eight years or longer to abandon and rail bank uh, the, the bridges. So the interim trail project may seem to some to be something that could start next week, and it's simply not true. If you add eight years to 2024 when the EIR is accepted, that's, what is that, 2032? Whereas I think we're told that the ultimate trail can be completed except for the bridge by 2029. So we need to stick with the ultimate trail. We need to honor the RTC agreements that have been made in the past, as well as the studies, the TCAA, the Unified Corridor Investment Study, and all of the grants that I would argue we, we uh, stand to lose, $67 million grant. Uh, so if we come up with this short-sighted design of abandoning the rail line, we could uh, easily lose that funding. So I hope that the council will join the Santa Cruz City Council in their unanimous vote when it came to eight and nine, a unanimous vote to support the ultimate trail direction. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Kaiser and council members. My name is Matt Farrell, and I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Board of Friends of Rail and Trail. Um, we want to thank uh, City of Capitola staff and uh, county staff, Rob Tidmore, and the other staff at Parks and Recreation at the county, and also um, Grace Blakesley from Regional Transportation Commission. We thank the collaboration and the proposal that's been brought before you today uh, represents the best opportunity to move forward on this. And we support the um, measures that are proposed for uh, Cliff Drive and Capitola Village in order to provide a transition op option for people, not only to continue on the trail, but also to access Capitola Village. I um, ride my bicycle to Capitola Village because my wife gets her hair cut in the village and we like to, and this Friday I'll be going there to have a glass of wine with her and her hairdresser after, and having improved bicycle access to the village will benefit me and a number of other residents in the county and in the village, and we really support those improvements. Finally, I'd just like to say that um, there are a lot of challenges around the interim trail on the um, trestle, and the most serious one is rail banking, and it will be a while if that option were chosen before it could even be approved, and rail banking is not a foregone conclusion. There are interests that are uh, concerned about rail banking, and uh, we would prefer having a solution that maintains the option that voters supported in the defeat of Measure D, which was to maintain the option for rail and for trail on the corridor. So thank you very much for the time and opportunity to speak. And uh, we urge you to move forward with the uh, item before you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. We're a local organization, thousands of supporters. We've been in for over a decade dealing with transportation and promoting the trail be built with the removal of the tracks. You know, the historical Capitola trestle is historical, and we need to save it. We don't need to lose it. We will continue to have it in our lifetime, and actually the analysis on that trestle is sal salvageable as a trail. It's a valuable resource, and we need to use it now. The ultimate trail is expensive. It's the most damaging to the environment, and they've only built one mile of it in over a decade because of the complexity. Even Guy Preston, who's now basically quitting the RTC after three and a half years, knew this, and that's why he recommended rail banking over years ago, because he knows that's the fastest way, the most cost-effective way, most environmentally friendly way to build the trail. 
He recommended it, Guy Preston, and he's leaving our organization. The legal challenges that will come about with the property owners, it's already happening. We know that the RTC doesn't fully understand their legal. We've seen the deeds. They're suing. There's lawsuits. So going with the ultimate trail will continue to delay it. The Co he also knows that the Coastal Commission will never approve a trail or a train that's 20 feet from the ocean. Sea level rising requirements will never allow it. Even with this elevated trestle trail that you're gonna build that's 14 feet high that you heard you don't have access points to, the Coastal Commission will deny it because of those access points. There's a bunch of holes in your plan, in this ultimate plan, and that's why we've only built one mile of it in a decade. Federal, some people don't know this, but federal guidelines for having a fast-moving train next to a trail, you need a 25-foot separation. That's just one of the many barriers that are to prevent us from having a train. And do we really want 60 trains a day driving over through Capitola Trust Village? We don't need to destroy our Capitola trestle. We need to use it now. We need to open that corridor, and we need to be realistic in how we build our trail and be proud of a trail. We, need, we don't want a 12-foot trail that costs twice as much as widening Highway 1. It's actually more than that. You're building a 12-foot tra trail that costs twice as much as widening Run. Let's save the Capitola trestle. Let's save it and use it today as a valuable transportation resource. You all can start the momentum. We've been dealing with this for over two decades. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi there. My name is Tina Andrietta, and I want to thank you for pointing out that we have 18 miles of the Coastal Rail Trail that's being built now. And in, you know, in a short time, we have the full funding. Thank you for your hard work. Um, the long-term vision has always been for a continuous ultimate trail with the new rail bridge. And as the gentleman, Mr. Barry Scott, mentioned that the, the design of the Capitola trestle could definitely keep, its, you know, keep, it, keep the beauty of it, keep the rail line, and have a maybe similar to what the uh, downtown uh, have a cantilevered trail next to the uh, next to the coastal you know ne excuse me next to the um, Capitola bridge when that gets built. My point being that the ultimate trail has been consistent from day one. We've got funding through the state of California. The ultimate trail was unanimously voted by not just Capitola voters, but the whole county almost by 74% in the last election. The interim trail went down in flames. So I'm asking you to continue with um, going forward with supporting the ultimate trail and all the hard work you folks have been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, honorable members of the council. Dennis Norton. Um, I was sitting up there um, uh, 24 years ago and we discussed the same issue. That's when they began to look at purchasing the corridor. I sat on the RTC 14 years through the time that we purchased the corridor, and it's never been the intent of this county to do anything but put a trail and a, and a rail line on that corridor. And that, that holds true today. The Monterey Bay. Um, Cine Trail was never intended to stay on the trail on the rail trail the whole time. It's never been intended to, and it still isn't. Even today, you're getting off the trail in Santa Cruz. You're going to be doing La Selva Beach. This is not a, a unique uh, program here. Other areas of the county will um, will require that you leave the rail corridor because it's not possible to go through it. Um, the other part of it is is that not one foot of rail has been removed in Santa Cruz County. Not one, not one foot. All that rail is still there. 
It really needs to stay in place. Taking people through the village, I, I would think that if I was a merchant down there, I'd be, I'd be really happy about that. You know, it, would, it, it brings people in, and as one gentleman says, they stop over there. Um, yes, it's a little bit of pedal out of the way, um, it, but the village itself could use a, a better bike corridor, which we, we would get out of this through the village. And so uh, people at Capitola will benefit from it. The, the, trestle, the trestle will be there. And uh, at the day it's rebuilt, it, can t it will be built to accommodate both, both uses of transportation. Um, I urge you to keep the plan of keeping people going through the village and stay off of the trestle now. It's, it doesn't do any benefit for the people who live here. It, it, yeah, it's, it, people will still be glad. And I, 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 as a bike rider, um, I would say um, there's many places I would jump off the rail trail just to get, get away from it. For instance, I would rather drive through Pleasure Point than I would on the rail corridor through everybody's backyards. And that's what we're asking here. So, so please, please keep, keep, the, keep the pedestrian traffic going to the village till we rebuild it and we can provide for both means of transportation because it will happen in this county. Thank you. Thank you. And next speaker. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, as always, I just want to thank you for all your time and service and study about this long, long, simmering issue. Uh, my name is Molly Ording, and my husband, Mickey, and I are 25 year plus residents of Capitola and actually just above Monterey Avenue in the portion of Monterey that we are discussing specifically tonight. I'm here this evening representing many residents of Monterey Avenue who all of us have probably met with either four or five former police chiefs in the past years in attempts to try to slow down and control the speeding and the traffic and the excessive noise on Monterey and onto Park Avenue. We are a directly affected neighborhood and we are solidly in favor at this time of this ultimate trail configuration. Our rationale being that purposely increasing both pedestrian and bicycle accessibility up and down Monterey will add to the safety and discourage the speeding and the dangerous driving that takes place there daily, yearly. There are already two wide, well-separated sidewalks, both on, both on the north and the south side for pedestrians. And by clearly marking bike lanes in both directions with green and white stripes that we see on a few streets in Capitola, Bollards and new thing I learned tonight, Sharrows on the street. We feel that um, we can slow the traffic, deter the traffic, and ensure the safety of bicyclists using Monterey Avenue. So we urge your support for the ultimate trail configuration and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Rosemary Sirica, and I work with Roaring Camp Railroads. Roaring Camp Railroads doesn't have the intention of running the passenger rail on the rail here, neither freight nor passenger. That will be somebody else that will do that. But we do have some expertise regarding rail banking. And in order to rail bank, there must be a filing of abandonment on the line. The only people who can file for abandonment are the RTC itself or the, with the cooperation of the operators and any, any operators on the line, which would include the um, regular operator Progressive or uh, Big Trees, which does freight on the line. Um, and that's not going to happen, not within anyone's expectations uh, because it's extremely important that we keep the line available. So if there's not going to be a filing of abandonment and there's therefore there's not going to be rail banking, 
therefore there cannot be an interim trail. Um, I would be happy to talk to anybody in more detail about rail banking, uh, which we all mostly learned about uh, under Measure D. But I think it's extremely important to make that very simple point. An interim trail cannot happen without a filing of abandonment, and there will be no such filing. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in house that wishes to speak? Seeing none, we will take it on online. Madam Mayor? Yes. If I may, for the people on Zoom and in person as well, I should have done this earlier. Just a reminder that public comments on agendized items must pertain to the agendized item. If they do not, we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The first speaker has been allowed to speak. You will have three minutes. Hey guys, it's John from Strongtown Santa Cruz. Uh, so about that trestle, we bought that trestle secondhand. If no one's, uh, people wanna know the history of that. So it was never a new trestle. It's not like a historical landmark. It's something we bought used and put there because we needed a trestle at the time. Uh, a shero is not a very fun thing. A shero is just a fancy word for the bikes and the cars in the same lane at the same time with no bike lane at all. So there is no bike lane from Park down to uh, Capitol Ave on Monterey. There's just cars and bikes in a single lane. Uh, the only thing that will discourage speeding on these lanes, it's not gonna be enforcement with the police. That's really isn't their job, to be honest. It's not gonna be signage, it's design. Design is how urban planners, and Jamie will tell you guys this, that is the only way to really control uh, road violence and behaviors of humans and cars on streets. So the solution here, uh, because it is gonna be years and everything will take longer and people are gonna protest and file appeals and whatever they can do to make this take forever, we're going to see like 10 years of Monterey Ave, just cars and bikes on the same way. And there's going to be so many accidents. If you just make Monterey one way, however, just make it into the city too. So it still gets all the parking for the businesses, all the people still coming down to the village, but just make it one way in that direction. Uh, you can have bike lanes on both sides. You could even put up some plastic or even concrete bollards if you really want to make those lanes nice. And then this trestle issue just goes away because we have a safe bike lane through the most dangerous part of the village that will maintain us until we figure it all out. So that is my suggestion. Uh, yeah, have a great night, guys. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker has been unmuted. You will have three minutes. We've asked you to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Paula Bradley, a Capitola resident and a cyclist. I urge the council to support the proposed bicycle and pedestrian improvements for a safer route through Capitola and proceed with the approved ultimate rail trail plan without delay. Despite what the Greenway people say, an interim trail and rail banking is a dead end. Rail banking will result in years of legal issues and delays. Property owners with a, with a rail easement may be eligible to apply for federal compensation. That means taxpayer dollars if the rail is removed and therefore there's no purpose for the easement. The best way forward for a multi-use trail is to proceed with bicycle and pedestrian improvements until the trestle is analyzed and eventually funded. We need to preserve the future option of zero emission public transit on the rail corridor for the city and county residents and visitors. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. The next speaker has been allowed to unmute themselves. They'll have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, hi, uh, my name is Johanna Lighthill. Uh, thank you for considering comments tonight. I'm a county resident. My comments relate mainly to safety issues on the ultimate trail proposed next to the tracks. It's my hope that the city council will share and address concerns and uh, provide comments to the ER, EIR. Um, the trail is described as mostly 12 feet wide. And this is a bit misleading. Tonight, we heard uh, that segment 10 ranges from 11 to 14 feet wide. However, Caltrans considers a 12 foot wide, uh, uh, excuse me, Caltrans considers a 12 foot wide trail as eight feet because uh, required shoulders and setbacks are required from the fence posts on either side of the trail. Um, so the 11 to 14 foot wide as described, take away four feet for the shoulders, you have a seven to 11 foot um, uh, wide trail. Eight foot is the minimum, 10 foot is pr preferred and 12 foot, 12 feet or more is recommended where heavier use is expected. Um, there's another trail planning guide that uh, explains that eight feet should only be used in very rare circumstances. Uh, quote, it is not desirable to place the pathway in a narrow corridor between fences for long distances as this creates personal security issues, prevents uh, users who need help from being seen, prevents path users from leaving the path in an emergency and impedes emergency response. So um, most planning guides explain that eight feet uh, significant user conflict can be expected. Um, the ATP grant, the largest ever awarded, um, will be used to, to create a trail that doesn't meet the minimum requir requirements by Caltrans. Um, that kind of is concerning, and uh, we're going to get a lot of conflicts. Yeah, another, another concern I have is that um, the only reason to consider building the ultimate trail is to accommodate a rail project, which hasn't been approved yet. In the EIR, there's no consideration to rail and trail interface, which means there's no consideration that a train might be actually run past people on this trail. And the trail next to the tracks, as proposed, overlaps into an easement that is currently owned by the rail operator. And there's no mention of possible conflicts with trail users and a train. Um, finally, the trail is said to provide new trans a new transportation corridor and will encourage people to bike or walk, but without passage over. Thank you. That's three minutes. The next speaker has been allowed to unmute themselves. You'll have three minutes. Hello, my name is Jean Brocklebank. I sent to the city council. Uh, a letter yesterday. I'm really hoping that all council members read it. If they didn't read it, then um, then it's almost <laughs> it's impossible to describe everything that I wanted to say. Uh, I noticed tonight that there are no homeowners of the mobile home parks within the city of Capitola who are here speaking to you about the fact that the EIR states that their homes will have to be re relocated. These are residents in Castle Mobile Estates, um, which is in the city of Capitola. Across the corridor is blue and gold. They're in the same, uh, they're in the same problem, even though they're not within the city of Capitola. And and why, you know, why do these homes have to be moved? If they could be moved, they can't be moved. Um, I don't think any of these homeowners know yet what is ahead of them if the ultimate trail is uh, approved and built. And that's why I suggest that the proposed project uh, option first phase, 16 foot wide trail down the center of the corridor is what the city of Capitola should recommend for 10 and 11. This will, will um, eliminate the homes <laughs> that stick in that that encroach upon the right of way and I noticed that 
neither Grace nor Rob tonight mentioned that. Everybody's focused on the trestle. They're focused on traffic in the city of Capitola, but the homeowners, uh, nobody's speaking on their behalf. So I hope that you will look again at this problem and I recommended that the city of Capitola, the county as a lead CEQA agency and the RTC have a responsibility to contact these homeowners and tell them what may be happening to their homes. Um, and and they're, I, think, I think they should be alerted. Uh, at, at a minimum. I'm really troubled by the fact that nobody else understands this uh, about what's going to happen. These are all affordable homes, low income uh, um, homeowners for the most part. And, and it's as though, let's build the trail, let's do our recreation, let's, let's just forge ahead and forget about these homeowners who don't even know this is going to happen. Um, I'm passionate about this. I, I think you- That's three minutes, thank you. The next speaker has been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. Is this for on the agenda or not on the agenda, public comment? You're commenting on agenda item 9A. Did you already have public comment? We did. Oh, okay. Um, let me let me read some more. I'm gonna put my hand down and put it back up. Let me just make sure I'm on the right topic. Okay. The next speaker has been allowed to speak. They'll have three minutes. Fuck niggers and fuck Jews. Cut the mic, please. And fuck you too, cunt clerk. That was not the clerk, that was the city attorney. Your comment is not related to the agenda Cut item. Cut the mic, please. Thank you. Hail Hitler. This is what. We have one more speaker. I'll defer that to the city attorney. If you guys want to cut the Zoom. Our last speaker has been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. All right. Thank you. That, that previous caller was something else. I'm sorry about that. I mean, our city's overran with Jews and niggers. Fuck those okay. They get Thank you. Okay. Did we take a few minutes? So, yeah, why don't we take a little bathroom break and we're going to discuss the Zoom possibilities for the rest of the evening. To move forward, uh, just with, uh, we would love to finish our item 9A here on trail segments 10 and 11, seeing as how we are here doing that now. Um, I know that we also have a large group here that is interested in item 9B, so I want to honor that. And um, I do have to preface that with an apology in the fact that we need to continue using Zoom for that item 9B, which does run us the risk of being put through what we just went through. Um, again, this is not um, indicative of Capitola. It is nothing that we stand for. Um, it's really, really sad that there are people in this world that will show up on, behind a computer screen and not in person and try and state things that are completely horrific. So um, that being said, the rest of the items, 9C, 9D, and then the item that was pulled earlier this evening, 8B, will be continued to the next meeting. So we will come back right now to council deliberation about item 9A and um, 
that's where we are. Mayor, there were still speakers on Zoom. Do you wish to continue public comment? Okay. You Yeah, that was closed, so yeah, no, thank you. So, council. Who's going first? <laughs> I'll start. Okay. Uh, I'll start first with just clarification from staff, um, our staff and our RTC staff. Is any decision that is made tonight going to impact whether there is an interim, interim or ultimate trail in Capitola based on the vote made Tonight. Go ahead, Joy. I'm sorry. I can answer that for you. Um, there is no, there's no decision made tonight will impact uh, where the trail will be in the. That's the uh, that will go before the county for a decision after the final EIR is adopted. I appreciate that. I just wanted to clarify that because this is an important issue, and I know that uh, it's important to folks on all sides, and I didn't want there to be any suggestion that regardless of the decision made tonight will have an impact on ultimate or interim or what I am calling ultimate ultimate which is the new the new bridge um, thank you I appreciate appreciate that um, so I, I understand that our direction this evening is to decide if as a council we want to provide comments on the EIR document to the county so I will start there um, I do think that as a council uh, I personally have if you know, some comments that I think would be worth sharing uh, in a letter to the county regarding the EIR. Um, I received an email from a resident with concern about um, a question about the EIR statement about how the project, regardless, the project, um, would res not result in the need for additional pr police protection or law enforcement facilities to maintain acceptable service ratios or response times. Um, but as far as I could tell, there was no indication of how that decision was reached, that that would be the case. And so I think it would be good for us to get additional information just on the methodology for how that determination was made. Um, and then while I understand that the EIR is specific to um, certain impacts in the uh, city, the, the environmental, it's an environmental document, um, I think if possible, to at least put in our comment letter that it would be beneficial um, that somewhere in the EIR it mentions that these are two options of essentially three options. Um, and the third one is not being mentioned because it is a separate project. So I'm not asking for that separate project, the new and replacement bridge, to be um, explained in any detail in an EIR for this project, um, that, but that perhaps it would be beneficial for there to be some kind of footnote in it somewhere that this is a project separate from the future bridge replacement, which is forthcoming. Um, I'll stop there for now and wait to hear from my colleagues. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I have a few concerns over uh, losing control with uh, not having our planning commission being involved in the process from the start to the ending. I don't know if we can hybrid that some somewhere to where we get information if, if it goes through the Coastal Commission and not through our Planning Commission. Um, losing control after hearing some of our residents is, is uh, kind of frightening. So that's, that's one comment I have. And, and the other being, we asked the county for a few things and they, they agreed to one but left two out. And, um, you know, building this project is really going to uh, be a burden on Capitola. So we, hopefully we can get a little bit more assistance there. Other projects with the ADA and the sidewalks. That's my comment. I just have a follow up question regarding the steps to planning commission. Um, if either one of you can address that that concern, and you know what future information will be going to planning commission post this um, evening's decision. Katie. Yep. Um, so the planning commission will review the tree removal permit for this application um, and we also as the city will be will be reviewing um, the the permit for grading as well and in regards to the items that we requested um, to or the additional items that we did not get in other words can you tell me and I think maybe either one of you can tell me 
what the grant process looks like and how likely it is that we would get those items. So I, I guess there's there's two ways you would get those. I, I want to make sure I understand. Are you asking how they would be added to the current segment 1011 project, or are you asking how they would be added to some sort of future uh, grant application in partnership with the RTC? In our in our packet, it was highlighted that two of our additional requests post the big giant grant that you received mm -hmm. were not um, included because we asked for them afterwards. But it's noted that there's a possibility for additional grant funding. Can you tell me a little bit more about that yeah. funding? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. It's something we've been um, putting our heads together about. Um, the first step really would be to apply for a planning grant um, so that you have these priorities identified. Um, that makes your project a much stronger candidate for obtaining state and federal funding. Um, and then the one other piece that we mentioned is didn't mention is that the portion of the Monterey Bay Scenic Sanctuary Trail that is identified through Capitola Village does make it eligible for Measure D funds, which the city of Capitola could request be used as a match to leverage state and federal funds. Um, your question about timing, well, this uh, RTC just had a consolidated call for projects. I know the city of Capitola has um, submitted an application, but not for these particular improvements. The next time we would have a consolidated call for projects is typically two years out. So it would be a, a few years um, uh, before you would be applying for um, capital uh, improvements. I would say, though, that RTC is going to resubmit an application for funding um, for the trail segments uh, for a federal funding source and we are contemplating how we may be able to wrap some of these requests um, into that application and that application is due in February. So we'll be working with your staff. Um, I had a question about um how the uh, wildlife will be affected um, between Monterey and Grove Lane. Um, specifically with the ability to cross the trail, as I saw the big walls that you were talking about earlier. Uh, thank you for that question. Yeah, so um, there are in the in the draft EAR, there are several environmental impacts identified. One of those is an impact to wildlife moving. Um, as as you noted, right now, um, you know the the rail corridor is rel relatively um, unused, and so right now, wildlife in the evenings take advantage of that and traverse along the rail line and potentially you know north south across the rail line as well. So the project would um, result in an uh, impact basically to wildlife movement, and that's. One of the impacts that's identified um, in the IR as a significant unavoidable impact. So, even though we'll be um, creating, preserving, and enhancing additional uh, habitat uh, for wildlife and uh, sensitive habitat in the area to the best of our ability to mitigate the impacts that are um, result from the project, there will still be a significant unavoidable impact to to wildlife movement in and along the corridor. I guess, is there anything that could be added to make it more, you know, suitable for a wildlife crossing to the designs? That's a good question. Um, I'm not aware of anything, but I, I'll, I'll bring that back to the design team and that's something we'll look at, um, you know, in the draft EAR and see um, what the response may be and what sort of design solutions may be applicable for that. Um, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with anything that could be done at a reasonable cost. Wildlife crossing, as you know, of, of infrastructure can be pretty expensive. Yeah, I'm just thinking that this walls just look very large and flat, and if, even if they were like textured so that different types of animals could scale them, might help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something we will look into. Thank you. Thank you. And 
So the additional comments I have for the EIR is we've heard plenty of comments about safety and the concerns of safety through the village. And I think it'd be really important to highlight the, I mean, you've talked about green lanes and bulb outs and all of those items, but to just really, um, I think someone said footnote that it is a high concern of myself and, uh, and our community here um, about the impact, uh, impact to pedestrians walking through just normally shopping and so forth. Um, and then the other comment for EIR is about, um, oh gosh, the, um, now I'm blanking because I was just thinking about all the safety stuff and it's been a distracting evening. Um, uh, the, no, not planning commission. Um, I'll think of it in a second if you guys have more comments, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, just timeline wise, so the, this EIR is circulating through December, right? And so when would you need to know if the consolidated development permit is approved by this body? Great question. Um, so the, the the Coastal Commission won't even consider a coastal development permit until after the environmental review process has, has been completed. So um, segment 8 and 9 is a, is a good example. That project has elements in the city of Santa Cruz, the county of Santa Cruz, and there's a portion of the project over the um, city of Santa Cruz Harbor, which is similar to so-called Creek, part of the Co Coastal Commission's original jurisdiction. And so um, because of that, and to avoid some of the issues that I mentioned tonight, that project, um, both the city and the county and the Coastal Commission consented to consolidation um, to, to streamline the permitting process. And we submitted an application um, or a letter requesting consolidation to the Coastal Commission, I wanna say maybe a month or two after the EIR was certified. So the EIR was certified in March uh, and we sent a letter in, in April or May. So the, that, that process would happen sometime in the spring of 2024. Okay, and then what is the timeline look like for these projects um, if, the, if, if the council approves the CDP and if we don't or otherwise, um, does the grant have a deadline is essentially what I'm saying. Because we're approving a, an EIR and a consolidated development permit that's tied to a grant, correct? Correct. And so does the grant have timelines of when these things need to be completed by? And does this kind of, does this impact that in any way? It, it, yes, it does. So um, I probably can't pull up the slide. So basically we have um, the, the deadline to complete environmental review is uh, the spring of next year. And, and that is working back from a deadline to basically allocate the final design and right-of-way funding in fiscal year 23-24. And the last date which we can do that is the June end of June CTC meeting. So working back from that date and going through the Caltrans requirements that are required to, to meet the, the um, requirements to allocate funding gives us a timeline of roughly uh, end of March in 2024 to certify the final EIR and complete NEPA process for the, for the project. So that's an environmental review. And then once we allocate funding, we have two years to complete final design uh, right of way and permitting for the project. So that's where, um, and that would, that would mean, you know, we're allocating for construction in, in 2026. And so that's what I mean when I say we have, we have deadlines that we're trying to meet. And so anything that we can do to uh, streamline the final design process, the right of way needs and the permitting of the process just reduces risk that we're gonna go over project schedule. Okay, so just to make sure that I understand the EIR, all that final, all that would need to be finalized by around February, because it'll finish circulating in December. And you said spring, actually, like March. Yeah, sometime in so yeah, March. I'm not sure exactly which date, but sometime in in late March, we'll be planning to certify the final EIR with the county. Okay, final EIR certified by March, funding allocated by June mm -hmm. for construction in 2026. Correct. Would the planning commission? have to wait until the final EIR in March for them to start considering if we were not to consolidate this permit. So we, they would have between March and what, June to hear and then issue any permits. I'm, try, I'm just trying to understand the timeline of all of this because my, my main concern to cut to the chase here is that if we don't consolidate and, we, and the grant is gone, we get nothing. So the, the risk that's there is if Planning Commission um, makes a decision, say, in April, 
And then if it were appealed, it would go to city council. And then if it were appealed by the city from the city council to the coastal, then coastal typically gets three months before, like in time to put something onto an agenda. That would be July. It would be passed when they would have needed to allocate the funding in order for that grant to be valid. Yeah, it, take, it takes time and that's not always, um, it, we've been through a lot of coastal uh, LCP updates recently and it, you don't always get it on within three months. So depending if they ask for more information and so it can definitely be three months is your kind of best case scenario for a coastal development permit. Okay. And can I interject a second? I, I really appreciate the, the conversation where this is going, but I just want to clarify that the deadline in June of 2024 does not include completing the permitting process. So the permitting, the, the final design right of way and permitting is from 2024 to 2026. And right. yes, the funding needs to be allocated by June. Correct. And we do not need the coastal development permit signed off by June of 2024 in, in order to allocate for the next. Oh, phase I see. Of okay. 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 You have two years. Correct. Two years. Oh, okay. okay. And and I'll just add on that. You know, as everyone knows, you know, construction prices are moving very strongly in the wrong direction. So, while we are committed to, as far as the state is concerned, starting construction in 2026, we're going to do everything we can to start construction earlier, so that we don't continue the inflation and the escalation, increasing prices for the project. So, while 2026 is our end goal, ideally we, we start construction sooner than that. Okay. All right, thank you. Yep. I remember now. I had that yeah. comment. It came back to me. Um, there was a comment about Caltrans and working with Caltrans and how much space we had versus like what a, away from the road and such. And so I just think that if there's any more clarity we can offer or add to the EIR for further explanation. And then there was a comment about Cliff Drive, and I, I know there was, you know, some conversations previously about encroachment and what's ours and theirs. Um, and I would just encourage staff to maybe reach out to that speaker um, to to clarify, you know, what options we or what what how this process affects what she was alluding to. So those are just my comments. Along with the homeowners of the mobile homes that. I, I don't know. I, the speaker seemed to think that they were not notified. Um, so I'd like to make sure that that happens. Um, RTC is just beginning the process to work with um, homeowners, the property owners and the mobile homeowners um, to discuss the encroachments that are occurring on the rail line from the mobile homes. Um, we've just completed um, a record of survey and we actually have our first meeting uh, with the Castle Mobile Home Estates property uh, manager to begin discussions uh, next month. Um, and then we will be um, contacting both the property owner and the mobile homeowners that are encroaching. Um, although it is a responsibility of the mobile homeowners or anyone who's encroaching on public property to remove their um, encroachments, RTC is committed to evaluating options and working with the mobile homeowners to come up with um, at least um, feasible options or to uh, address the encroachment we realize. It's a very sensitive issue. Thank you. Okay, I can take it back. Um, yeah. I just wanted to clarify for um, Monterey, there's no room for bike lanes going on both directions. It's not at all possible. So we haven't, I, I want to say there is not just from observation, but without a study. I, I don't think it's been studied, but it does not look like there's any room for two bike lanes. That's why we have the Sharrows already. I'm confident in saying there's not room. Yeah. I was walking on it today. <laughs> okay. You can only get down to about 10 foot travel lanes. And just not that much room. Okay. Um, so I don't think you need any more information. You have all the direction you need for the EIR statement. Um, and I think in terms of trying to meet the, the goals of the grant funding and so that we don't lose and can see some sort of trail conversations continue, um, I'm happy to um, make a motion. And I'm trying to pull it up, but I'm scared that Julia will touch anything up there. Um, for the CDP. Direction on comment letter and consolidate social um, 
Also permit request for the Central Coast Rail Trail segments 10 and 11. To You're looking to <laughs> authorize the Community Development Director <laughs> to <laughs> consolidate the CDP with the county? Yeah. Okay. Let me just, and I can happily say that for you, so you don't have to go. Sorry. That can just be your motion. Is that okay? Yes. While she's looking, concerned. while she's looking at that, do we have to vote on that today, or, or do we not have time? You do have more time if you want to make a decision at a different hearing. It, it does not have, you, you do have the option of having me bring this back at another time, but it sounds like we have a. I would like to hear more about what. Oh, I made a motion, Council Member Clark. I'm sorry. Sorry, so, I thought you were still. Uh... No, no, no. I I'll give consent, City, the consent to a consolidated CDP at this time. I'll second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Maybe we have a roll call, please. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Clark. No. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. Passes four to one. Okay, so we're moving on to our final piece of tonight's evening. One, one question before we leave. I've, I took down, I think, looks like six or eight comments. And so that's the intent, the comments that we heard tonight from the council members to include in the comment letter for the EIR. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll do that. Uh, so item 9B is to receive a report about the Police Chiefs Advisory Committee and review the application and selection process and provide direction to staff. And our chief is presenting this evening. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> I'm here this evening to talk about the um, upcoming Capitol Police Chiefs Advisory Committee, provide a report for you, uh, for everyone. Give you a little background on what it, on what it is. So, next slide. <clears throat> so just some background. Um, this conversation started back in 2020 when, following the death of George Floyd, many communities began discussing this discussions around police policies and procedures. Um, following that, in 2021, the uh, Criminal Justice Council of uh, Santa Cruz County, which is the CJC, and the members at that time was Chief McManus and Councilmember Brown. Um, they did an overall regional study of what the policies are in the in the county. Um, the good news with that is that the widespread policy alignment is in Santa Cruz County, and then they banned, there was the eight can't wait, and this is kind of a representation of the things that were in alignment with the other agencies within this, in Santa Cruz County. So we, like I said, those are the nine things. Next slide. So following that re review under Chief McManus, we began <clears throat> as an agency researching different Chief Advisory Boards and Commissions for Capitola. As part of that, in 2021, through our Sergeant's Promotional Exam, we, we had a, each applicant write a research paper on the benefits of CACs and how they, would, how they could be adopted in, in Capitola. Um, we reviewed those. Um, we also started reviewing different agencies, both small agencies, medium-sized agencies, and a little bit larger agencies. <clears throat> Specifically, um, we reviewed uh, Chico Police Department's uh, Chiefs Advisory Board, Santa Cruz Police, and Watsonville Police. Um, I also interviewed the different chiefs from those different organizations and collectively put together the policy that's in your packet. So that's our new Capitola Police Policy number 217. Next. <clears throat> and then just to, uh, there's been some kind of confusion, it seems like, about the difference between a, a Chiefs Advisory Committee versus like an oversight board. And so the intention is for a Chiefs Advisory Committee I just wanted to highlight that this is the Chiefs Advisory Committees are more of a proactive approach to where uh, Capitola wants to meet with the community representatives um, to, to have a place that we can talk about what's going on, to learn about the police department, um, to kind of build those relationships. And then we can, building those relationships, we can have the partnerships to talk about police policies as we move forward and really proactively address p potential problems in the community. Where the Oversight Committee is, is more where police and sheriff's organizations that maybe um, have done improper things. And so the council or there will be a board to oversee kind of the operations. And a lot of times they do, um, they have the ability to investigate misconduct or um, actually make recommendations to policies. And it's more of an accountability thing. So that's, again, that's like Oakland. Police has an, has an oversight board. 
most agencies, like I said, it's more of a community-based, it's a proactive approach, it's more towards the community advisory committees. Uh, next slide. So um, this is just kind of four points on the goals and objectives of, of, of the vision of the CAC. So our, our department mission is always to collaborate with, with the community and, and, and quite honestly just make capital better and safe for everyone. And we really want that to be inclusive to everyone. So we want to include the residents, the business, the community, and also the visitors. And we really at Capitol Police highly value the partnerships with the community and recognizing that the public engagement is, is an important um, aspect of community policing. Um, the CAC, the, the vision of it is that members will advise the chief on community issues and public policies that, have, and that influence or impact the ongoing relationships. And again, it's an advisory group. And then um, lastly, the CAC, the members do not have the power to, to, or authority to investigate, review, or, or participate in other uh, personnel matters or, or play a role in any type of criminal or civil, civil litigation. They will be privy to, um, like I said, learning a little bit more about the police department, the city, and how we operate. Um, and again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relationship building um, environment. Next. So... Some of the topics that we'd like to, to bring forward to this group, um, one of the things is the, the an, unmanned aircraft system, which is the drone policy. Um, we're looking at uh, automatic, automated, automated license plate readers, which are flock cameras. Um, we're, we want to review what's going on in Santa Cruz with the oversized vehicle stuff and look at those impacts as they kind of migrate this way and, and be proactive with that. Uh, we want to look at some, you know, what the, the the department website and how um, we want to have it be transparent. We want it to be accessible so people have um, good information. And then um, another topic that's kind of just looming out there is just what's going on with the mental health services and the, the way that the police department and mental health and how we, how we intersect there and, what, and the challenges that's going, really going on in Santa Cruz County. So kind of highlighting those things. So those are just some topics um, for this group. Uh, next, next slide. So, um, so a little bit about the composition of the, of the committee. It's in the policy itself. So we're seeking a diverse representation of Capitola residents and business owners. Um, again, we want to encourage a cross-section of active community members. Like I said, it, you have to be, it's a, it's a proactive community, so you have to have, we want people that want to be active with this. Um, so we're looking for those that are in the educational section, uh, nonprofit, public uh, relations, faith communities, youth, or, youth organizations, um, we're, like I said, we're looking for dedicated representatives um, that, that really are not focused on themselves, but more about the overall good of the community. So it's not an individual thing. We're, part of that is their working agreement that, that they'll have to agree to. Again, it's not a personal thing. It's something that, that they want to bring Capitola forward. Um, this is a little bit of a change um, from initially it was six to eight members, but understanding, um, you know, it's a, it's, it is a smaller community. So we want to kind of Look at a minimum of four people on that committee, no more than eight. And then the term itself is a two-year term, looking at like quarterly meetings. Um, again, they have to be committed to the mission. And then also a, a big piece of it is they do need to have a techno, technical ability to, to understand policies and procedures because, again, they're going to be reviewing that type of stuff. Um, and like I said, they just have to have uh, some technical understanding of that. Again, the membership is definitely voluntary, uh, well, is not compensated. And then uh, staff, de staff develop the policy, the qualifications, the application, and also the working agreement. Uh, next. So we started recruitment in July with the goal of um, starting, um, starting in, in October. We posted on Facebook, Nextdoor, in, um, Facebook, Instagram, Nextdoor, city website. We had a question an answer section there, and we also had some articles in our Capitola Waves. The result of that is we, we did have 12, about 12 inquiries and received eight completed applications. Um, following those applications, I followed up interviews with each one of those uh, individuals, explained the expectation, our mission, and, 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 and the uh, expectations of this new committee. Um, of those, all applications were accepted and initially approved to move forward. Next. And then when we announced that on October 6th um, in, a, in a Friday update, we, um, <clears throat> we really realized that the compensation or the composition of the group probably needed, we needed some more outreach and, and um, a 
part of that is, is, is part of the policy is that it allows for me to reopen that application process um, to increase the diversity of the community members. So at this point, I want to keep the current CAC applications and then go out, like I said, the next steps is more recruitment and then obviously just a lot more outreach. Next. So the plan that we're proposing is to reopen the recruitment for another two months. And we want to concentrate on obviously the Capitola's diverse community members. And we want to broaden the scope of applicants to allow for the Capitola's sphere of influence to apply. We have a map of that in the back. I think we've, we've applied that same standard to a couple of our commissions that we have. Um, translate the, the application into Spanish and then also repost on the city website and then again on all social media platforms. Um, we want to recruit by publishing information in the local newspapers and again post it to uh, city buildings, kiosks, community center, libraries, some mobile, the mobile home parks, and then obviously some of the service industry locations. Next. Uh, additionally, we want to um, reach out directly to these organizations, the so Santa Cruz County Diversity Center, the Bay, Air, Bay Avenue Senior Center, NAACP, Rio College, some of the faith-based or faith -based organizations, family resources, the mental, mental health groups. Next. So with that, like I said, we want to get back out there, re-recruit, get some more applications. So um, we have estimate that um, these recruitment efforts could cost approximately $3,000. Some of the information to get out to get out to publicize costs of money. And then, um, as I stated, my intention is to return with the, the appointments, an annual working plan, and then any costs associated with that recruitment. Next slide. So the recommended action for tonight, and if you have any questions, is to receive the report about this Chief's Advisory Committee, if you have any questions about it, advise on any new recruitment efforts, the application and select in the selection process. And then, like I said, uh, the intention is to extend the, the recruitment for another two months, conclude the, or conduct the interviews, and then return to council with the appointments and any fiscal impacts. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. This is exciting. Do you have questions? Yeah. Thank you, Chief Daly, for the report. Um, you mentioned in three slides prior that your intent was to um, to keep the current eight, but you're going to recruit more. Is that how I read it? I'm sorry. No, I, I just keep those applications Not and then go out, re-recruit, and then come back with a decision on who. Oh, okay. Thank you. That was my question. I've got a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, so in your criteria to have technical ability to understand policy and procedures, can you elaborate on that? Because that seems pretty open to interpretation. Yeah, well, so, I mean, the, the, some of the discussions are gonna talk about reading and understanding and understanding policies. So just having that ability. So um, like I said, they need to come forward with the ability to read and understand policies. So is the requirement to be able to read? Or, you know, how would you specifically decide if somebody is able to read and understand policies compared to somebody who is not and use that as an objective criteria when selecting your committee members? What's that? Oh. Um, so as far as, like I said, this is a, it's a group um, that uh, technical ability. So, you know, we want to see if they can fill out the application, can have an interview. Um, you have a conversation, be open to, to the thought process. Again, it's not an individual, it's more about a, a broader, broader scope. And so, like I said, the, the process itself, um, I think would lend towards that understanding of it. So have to fill out the application, have to you know, read and write, have to understand the policies. Um, so that there's no kind of test on the policies though? No, no. Just the Basically, the ability to apply. And yeah, understand, in the apply, be reasonable. Yeah. Um, doesn't seem particularly objective. Um, my next question is um, in regards to the criteria for not influenced by personal agendas. I'm wondering what this means specifically and if you can provide an example of possible personal agendas that would restrict a person from joining this committee. Yeah, so if... If someone came to the committee and was 
voicing a very singular or, or their opinion on something. Again, uh, the group is designed to provide a conduit between the police department and the, and the public. And so um, I would, the expectation, and part of that is that when we, when we meet, is that we have a working agreement that they're, they're going to be professional. Again, the idea is that we don't want a personal agenda. We want them to come as a community member, and they want a, a voice of the community. So whatever community that they or background that they represent, that they're a voice for them, much like a council member, not as, not as an individual, but as a, as a community member. Okay, I'm, I'm still having a hard time understanding specifically what. So an example would be, um, I wouldn't want someone to bring forward that they have a concern about something that's happening like traffic on their particular street. If they wanna talk about traffic in general, that would be right. so it's not like I want to talk about traffic on my particular street. I want to talk about traffic in the community and, and how that impacts. In general. Yeah. Okay. Again, if I if I saw someone that was not participating in that kind of in the mm -hmm. in the in the as the group, again, that would be discussions that I would have to have with that person is that are they want do they want to be a part of this working group as a community group or as an individual thing? And I want right want because I, I just feel that individual experiences often lead people to want to get involved in things like this. Like that's how people form their opinions and are able to um, join committees like this or join local government to help other people who may be in their same position, right? So it just. Um, I think that that's a fine balance and, and also not particularly objective. Thank you. And one quick question. Thank you for bringing this to us. It's, it's good information. Um, but I think what we're, we're looking for is people that not only can read, but can use a computer, have an email, correspond, and maybe do Zoom, some of those types of things. Um, stay involved and to be part of the, the cab. Yeah, like I said, I think this is an opportunity for this group to learn a lot about the police department. Like I said, my, my vision of it is that it's, it's, it's a kind of a hybrid of even a citizen's academy. Like I really wanted this to be, a, you know, have some, some training involved with it, implicit bias training, and then moving on to doing other tours of different facilities. Again, just learning a lot about what, you know, what the police department does, what our challenges are, um, you know, like I said, visits to different netcom, all these different areas that, like I said, that, that not everyone gets access to. Right. With that, with that being said, would, would you be open to in, in including people from the, uh, the council if they wanted to be involved in some of the training to see what's going on since it's a new program for us? I, quite honestly, I'd be open to really that anyone that wants to put Capitola and, and learn more about Capitola, we want to, you know, for the focus is really the safety aspect, I would, I'd welcome anyone. So <laughs> had, had trouble with the mic there. Um, I'm sorry, I was probably on the slide and I overlooked it. Was there, was youth a part of the groups that you were going to do outreach to? Because I would be interested in having a youth member, a student member on this um, in the same way that we do in our other boards and commissions. Yeah, that's, that, that is, that there, there are some potential challenges with that as far as like when we were having the meetings, access to certain areas, like if we were to do a jail tour, different stuff oh, like sure. that, that may limit those things. Um, but again, I, you know, what, what the makeup is, uh, we clearly want some youth representation, whether it's maybe it's something, somebody at the school that's, that's embedded in the school. Um, uh, it could be, again, the, the core group itself. Um, like I said, there, there would be challenges with that as far as what my vision is, as far as the, the field trips or whatever that we would want to take. Because again, some of those areas, they're, we're going to kind of pull the, the curtain back on some areas that aren't always accessed. And so... And, and then also um, opening up, um, you know, secured facilities and stuff like that. So, okay, again, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. We can take this to public comments. Anybody in house wish to speak? That's right. Jump on in. 
I'm Linda Smith, an esteemed mayor, vice mayor, council members, and staff, all of you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. The Capitola PD has heart. It sets it apart from other agencies that I've had experience with. Excuse me. Even before May of 2020, I saw it in how our officers conducted themselves in difficult situations that I witnessed. Capitola has a reputation for being a safe and engaged community, and many of our residents buy homes here because of that. Maintaining that safe environment is the priority of Capitola's PD, and it shows. I've been encouraged watching the current leadership develop our police department and believe that we are, more, we are a more welcoming and yet still safe environment in Capitola because of its leadership. Tonight's been shaky. I apologize for the shaky. I don't think the community is fully aware of what they do in the background to keep us safe while respecting the rights of all individuals. And we need to do a better job of outreach so that all of the community do know and understand our PD better. Thus, the advent of a Chief's Advisory Committee. There are people in Capitola that are underrepresented people that feel uninvited or unwanted because of ethnic or economic differences or because of encounters with Capitola's police officers or other residents not like them. There are also residents that have felt disenfranchised because of the movement of hatred against the police after the George Floyd's death. Our Capitola PD is caught in the middle trying to navigate to a better police community relationship while facing issues of encroaching homelessness, drugs and mental illness, and ever-changing legislation intended to bring more racial and economic equity, but sometimes making it more difficult for them to do their job. The advent of the Chief's Advisory Committee is intended to provide better insight into how to keep us safe and move us forward together. And I got that from my interview with Chief Daly. I support the re-recruitment effort proposed by staff. By assuring participation from underrepresented groups, RPD will be much more successful developing new programs and utilizing emerging technologies that help identify bad actors and capture suspects. When successful, the effort will gain more citizens who want to protect Capitola rather than do harm to it. Someone recently said to me, some of our community won't listen because it's you that's doing the talking. They need to hear it from somebody more like them. I thought about that for a bit, and I get it. Three minutes, thank you. We should be encouraging them, but we need to, for them to come from our community. Thank you. Just kidding. Anybody else in house wish to speak? Okay, I don't see anybody, so here we go. Let's go online. The first speaker has been unmuted. You'll have three minutes. Hello again, guys. Uh, we do have a fantastic, uh, underpaid, but fantastic police force. Uh, and this committee is a great idea. I really suggest you all reach out to Tyree Ritchie. Uh, he's like the obvious choice to be on this. And in general, the demographic, uh, you can have people who are very interested, but try to make this committee not look like every other committee. It's the same 30 people on every th single thing. I go to all these meetings. You guys know who I am. It's so sad, our level of participation in civics right now. Uh, and a lot of it is because it's unwelcoming. Uh, this would be an easy way or a very easy commission or committee to just get a couple people on who aren't the same faces we see everywhere else. And yeah, look into Tyree. He even lives in Capitola. Fantastic choice. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker um, will have three minutes once they start. Hi, I was just still wondering why Jews are allowed to suck baby penis. Okay. Thank you. There are no other speakers there. 
Okay, great. We will take this back to council. Um, any comments? Mm -hmm. um, excellent report. Thank you, Chief Daly. And I first want to say thank you to all the applicants who did apply and to who are paying attention and who step out of their way to commit their time to our community. It does not go unnoticed. And I, I really appreciate them stepping forward. Um, so there's just a couple points I want to make. Um, it doesn't identify it on the police policy, but I think having more guidance on ensuring that the BIPOC community, that there's membership from all different um, from all different walks of life, the LGBTIQ community, um, the youth representation groups. I don't know, and this could be a legal thing, but if there was a youth voice, could you invite the parents? Um, when I think about diversity, I think about the when we had the mobile home park item come and we just had such a great mix of people. I saw it on your outreach there. Um, there's a question about whether you live in, remove the question about being a resident because it's not a requirement, it says on the policy on the application. So I don't think that's important to add that to the application because you asked for the address anyways. Um, in regards to the technical capabilities, I understand I can't amend your policy this evening, but today you, you shared that you're gonna um, post in English and Spanish. Well, when you get a, an answer in Spanish and you, you can't read it, you know, how are you gonna support them in, in understanding the technical skills? So I just want you to have a, a think about that and how you can encourage um, Spanish speaking families to apply because it's gonna be in Spanish and then how you can support them to participate. You know, we have a wonderful um, police department who also speaks Spanish who might be able to help translate on Zoom um, or, or be there to, to support those families. Um, and I think that's it. I think this is a great idea moving forward and I love all the next steps and I really appreciate all your hard work on this. So thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo that. I think this is, um, these are great next steps. I'm, I'm, uh, happy to see the list of organizations and kind of community groups that you're planning to do outreach to. Um, I uh, appreciate the, the eight that have applied and, and I think that we're going to have uh, additional applicants and it's going to be a really good group of people. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I also want to thank you, Andy, for this great job. It seems like a super cool initiative. Um, really glad to see this moving forward. I would say, um, again, kind of based on my earlier comments, I would like it if we could remove the maybe technical ability language. Obviously, I understand, like, yeah, they have to be able to apply, go, you know, meet, follow through, you know, basic skills. Um, but I just wouldn't want to turn people away based on that language of technical ability because that is very vague. That could be open to interpretation. We could be turning people away who would be some of the best candidates for this role um, because they feel like they may be underqualified. Um, and again, I would also um, advocate that when uh, interviewing and deciding who joins this committee that you wouldn't... Um, completely get rid of applicants if they do come in because they are passionate about something that they personally experienced. Because I think that's how you get some of the best insights is people who have been wronged by systems and are trying to change them. Um, and then my third comment is, if there's any uh, possible language you could use to encourage, if not youth members, young adults, you know, 18 to 25, I think oftentimes uh, people in those age brackets don't feel comfortable, you know, joining these kinds of committees and maybe need some extra encouragement and would prove to be valuable voices. Thank you. Um, I know I shared some of these ideas earlier, but when I think about the, the flyers and going in English and Spanish, not many people know what advisory means and it was really clear in the presentation today. And so even just including that on the flyer of like, what is an advisory? Because so many of these people have not had access or awareness to you or the police department. And so this is their first time being able to be with someone so powerful. Um, and so they just might not know what their the opportunity is or if there are limitations or 
what the heck an advisory is. So to your point, Council Member P Peterson, of just like just being really clear on the advertisement, being clear on the application, um, and if we're going to do it again in English and Spanish, making sure that there's some sort of language in there that says you're going to support them during your your um, your meetings. So um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for coming and presenting because I know I knew nothing about this and it's exciting to be excited about a new program. I think it's awesome. Um, and yes, thank you to all the applicants that have come out and um, continue to dedicate time to our awesome city. Um, I, I do. I really like this list. Um, you know, you've got Cabrillo in there and Latinx and um, I do think. Um, oh, the diversity center is on there. Cool. Okay. Um, also, I do. Did it? Is it? I'm sorry. Is it required for them to be a resident of Capitola, or are we using this sphere? So we're we're going off the sphere of influence, okay. and I think there's a slide. Yeah, Ap Aptos, Capitola, Soquel, Live Oak. I I think that's important as well. I mean, we're such a destination for all of our neighboring towns that I think um, outreach around us would be helpful as well, especially because, you know, some people might live there, but work here types of things. Um, and I got you on those uh, food service people. I can definitely do some outreach there for you for sure. So just let me know what you need from me. And um, yeah, I'm excited about this program. And um I, I don't want to make it that like somebody on council has to be on it or anything like that, but I'm super interested in like doing, you know, um, tours and stuff too. So if any of that stuff comes about, let me know. Yeah, it's cool. Um, At least the, oh, academy. Oh. <laughs> the academy part would be good and, and ride alongs for absolutely everybody and yeah. so on and so on. But all the good stuff. For sure. Um, you have a question? I've, oh. Person, go ahead. I, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Is it possible? Will there be any kind of like flyer or social media that we as council members can share into our networks as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank. You. Welcome that, please. Okay. Okay. I have a question. So, it says to uh, broaden the scope to allow for capital a sphere of influence. And Julie, can you pull up that map again? Because I know the LAFCO sphere of influence, but here it also says Aptos, Capitola, Soquel, Live Oak. In the staff report? Yes. Yes. So we, we did pull up the, the map, and I wouldn't say that it represents Aptos. You'll have to look. I think the sphere of influence kind of flows more Mostly into like a tiny bit of pleasure Live point Oak area. And pleasure point, yeah. which to me seems a little bit arbitrary when considering who actually utilizes Capitola, considers that a part of their home. I mean, Capitola is only about a mile and a half. So I, I would personally advocate for including Ap Aptos, Capitola, Soquel, Live Oak in the sphere, because really this is like, a you know, kind of an abstract bureaucratic map. It doesn't really encompass our, you know, sphere of influence. Thank you. Well, I guess just for from better direction to like when we think about the women's center or um, like other nonprofits, they, those executive directors or that staff might not be in the sphere of influence, but they support people in our community. So um, I guess I would just caution with using that as a driving force to um, when looking at applicants, because I think it's just really important that um, when we look at educational programs like Boys and Girls Club, are housed in Live Oak, and if you're looking at, you know, like different types of folks to have input, but their kids are from here, you know. So I, I definitely agree with you, Councilmember Peterson, about ex thinking, ex expanding that into the Live Oak, and just in general thinking about the agencies that serve rather than being exclusive. I would almost um, consider also having people that work here. You know, if we're having business owners that could live across the country. Why not include people that work here every day, spend the majority of their days here contributing to our community? Wait, can we, can we clarify that? 
business owners are currently on the list, people who own businesses in Capitola. People who own businesses in Capitola can live anywhere in the world and still be allowed on this committee. So what I'm saying is just as a contrast that, you know, we should consider allowing people who work here every day on the committees. We, sh we should allow people that work here every day on the committees and be without getting too into the weeds of like, you need to be a business owner with a brick and mortar company that operates here 80% of the year. Like <laughs> without going into that level of detail, I do think there should be solid ties to the city. Be it that you work here every day, you're within the sphere of influence. And I, and I see your, your point also, um, Councilwoman Brooks, about that might mean that your solid tie to the city is that you work for a nonprofit organization that has a number of clients here in Capitola. And I don't, again, without getting into the weeds, I think maybe we can just give, w would the council feel comfortable giving general um, suggestive, suggestive direction to the chief to prioritize those with a strong tie to Capitola and leave it up to his judgment at that point? Or would we need to go more prescriptive than that? I'm comfortable. I'm going to see what you come back with. And we can, if, if we don't feel that that's what you've presented, then we can have the conversation again. But I trust that you're going to do an excellent job. Great. It's not enough direction for you. OK, thank you. great. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yes. Thank you so much for bringing that back to us. Um, and that's all we need, right, for that one? Okay, great. Thanks so much, Chief. Um, okay, as stated before, um, we are going to move everything else to the next meeting. Uh, 8B from this evening, 9C and 9D will be continued. Um, thank you, everybody, for bearing with us this evening. Um, and we will adjourn to the next City Council meeting on November 9th, 2023 at 6 p.m. Everybody, be nice to one another. <laughs>